Okay, good morning. It's February 3rd. Wow, February. And welcome to open session. Before we get started, please let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and also for taking a moment of silence. Uh, and then we'll get started. Thanks. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Okay, I'd say I love that pledge, <laughs> every word of it. Um, okay, let's start with uh, Priority Carroll, uh, District 4. Oh, good morning, thank you very much. Well, this month is Black History Month, and I want to take this opportunity to mention that the Carroll County Historical Society will have a box lunch talk in honor of Black History Month on February 15th from at noon until one o'clock it'll be virtual the topic is creating memorials and it will feature african-american carvers sebastian hammond and caleb mcpeak so if you get a chance please go to the historical society's website and take the opportunity to join in and see what we have in store for you for black history month as the month goes along i'll mention other things mr swam do we have anything else here to share with the, the public this morning There is the trail over, the rail trail out in Mount Airy is presently under construction. We've offered money to help on this through our parks and rec. It's a very beautiful trail. It's a cutout through the ridge over in Mount Airy. I took some photos. It's absolutely gorgeous this time of year with all the water freezing. And I'm trying to encourage as many people as possible this time of year, please get out and hike, bundle up and go for a walk. So often this <coughs> time of year where we get quite lethargic and bundle up in our cozy homes. But there's a lot of tremendous beauty out there in our parks, so please get out there and see those. And I'll do a follow-up on the reconstruction of the rail trail over Mount Airy. I'm very excited about this. We also have here five Marylanders will be in the Super Bowl this year. This is incredible. Three with the Bengals, as you see here. Two with the Rams. One is from Mount Airy, and I think most of them are down in Montgomery County. But it's a tremendous honor to have all these great athletes from the state of Maryland competing in the Super Bowl this year. So we'll be rooting for them and enjoy the game. Do we have anything else? And that'll be it. All right, thank you very much. You have a lovely day. Okay, District uh, 3. Oh, thank you. Just want to comment, the frozen water, they have a new name for that. It's called ice. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say, um, at the MAKO Legislative uh, Committee meeting, we had virtually, uh, yes, was it yesterday? Yesterday. Yeah. We are again had another um, rundown of the governor's budget. <clears throat> Um, just, I mean, we did. I mentioned it last time. There were no bills that this time that I thought were so out, outlandish that I need to mention them. And actually, it's about all that that I did this week, except my other, you know, stuff. But it's all I did for the county here. Um, that's about it for me. Thanks. Okay, Commissioner Wentz. Do I get his extra time? <laughs> you, you go for it. No. Those that are the thousands of viewers that are watching this morning, I'm in a different spot. We're trying to distance ourselves. Uh, I did not demote to the attorney. Okay. <laughs> so I want to make that clear, even though I feel like I'm sitting in a hole. Here. So anyway, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first off, the groundhog is stupid. Uh, just want to point that out. Apparently, there's uh, some more weather coming. I think is that on? It's on, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Test, test. Am I good? Okay. <laughs> Didn't the groundhog die or something? Well, uh, yeah, the groundhog in uh, New Jersey died, but Phil saw his shadow, so, you know, six more weeks, but whatever. I don't want, it was cloudy up there, so I don't know how that happened. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so he's only right like 39% of the time, uh, which is interesting. So, so he's a weatherman. Well, yeah, okay, well, there you go. Um, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't start out by thanking everybody uh, that uh, 
was involved this weekend with um, firefighter paramedic uh, Bobby Jones's uh, funeral. Uh, it was uh, a, a great day, and uh, you know appreciate everybody that uh, had a part in that. I want to thank Director Mike Robinson for taking the lead. Uh, we are so blessed to have someone with his level of experience because uh, just like myself, Mike's been there and done that uh, with, with the funerals. And uh, it's, it's not easy. It's a huge logistical uh, challenge. And uh, he, he took it, and along with a lot of other folks. And uh, so it, it just it went off very well. And I want to thank the folks at Reese uh, for, for providing all the support that they did. So uh, a, a very, very somber day, but a great send off for, for Bobby. And I want to thank everybody that attended there. Uh, and of course, then yesterday, I don't know if, if you had a chance to see, uh, I was going to attend, but then I didn't. Uh, I watched the whole thing. Uh, they streamed it, the funeral for the three Baltimore City Fire Department uh, folks, and uh, that was uh, unbelievable. Uh, I know, Ed, you went, I don't know if that's your first time at Delaney Valley with a fire department funeral or not, but I've been there for many times, and, you know, usually the, uh, the, the processionals are just, they're, it, they're, mm -hmm. all, they're always very long. Mm -hmm. Well, yesterday, when the, the three fire engines carrying the bodies of the three city fire departments individuals turned into Delaney Valley, the back part of it had not left the convention center yet. So it took a long oh time. Wow. Uh, and uh, it was a long day. And, uh, you know, they, I, hmm. I, I followed it all the way up until they went to the wake uh, at, the, at the fairgrounds. But uh, just another honorable day. And I don't know if anybody's seen <coughs> or saw uh, the police department funerals in New York City. Uh, they, had to, they had to shut down Fifth Avenue. Uh, there were thousands of police officers there, uh, but it's just, it's remarkable, uh, you know, the, the amount of respect that's being shown to those of us in public safety. And I got to give a shout out because I think the figure was there have been 37 police officers shot uh, in the month of January and five of them have died. So we're, this, this, this country's in an interesting place right now. Is that across the country? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, it, it's it's important to to remember all of those that are serving on the front lines uh, wherever it is whether it's in armed forces ed that you respectfully are a part of or, or those of us in, in the fire and police uh, it, you know keep keep everybody in your thoughts not just on the days that you have to but every day governor gave his last state of the state address last night mm -hmm. if you haven't had a chance to uh, if you didn't get a chance to hear it uh, the, the text is out there. I thought, uh, I typically don't try to get too political here, uh, but over the eight years that I've served here, or almost eight now, uh, I've had a tremendous amount of respect for Governor Hogan and what he's brought to this state. And if you read his State of the State address, uh, it's, it's remarkable where we started in 2014 and where we are now. Uh, I have never had an unkind word for that gentleman, and I appreciate what he's brought to the state. And most of that has trickled down to us, which made our jobs easier here at the local government, uh, General Assembly aside. So anyway, uh, get a chance, read his text. Uh, also attended uh, MACO with Commissioner Fraser yesterday. We s well, I started at 9.30 with the tax subcommittee, and about two minutes of one, we got out of there. The bills are flying in there and some of them make everybody shake your head so it's another one of those years which is always like that in annapolis so uh commissioner frazier and i are keeping a close eye on all of those uh, with mako and uh, we'll have more to come and we're going to hear from mike fowler our legislative liaison who does an awesome job of keeping us informed down there as well so he'll be up next and finally a planning and zoning meeting last night uh, and uh, that was a good good meeting and um, we didn't do a whole lot there we did we did something that was unusual with a property down in Sykesville apparently there was some sort of a uh, tag on the property uh, when it came to uh, 
getting into it that had been there for years, uh, some sort of an easement issue, uh, and the gentleman wants to build a home and wants to be near his son, so we, planning and zoning took care of that. But it was an interesting story, and I'm not going to go into it today, but it's one I'd never heard before in the seven years and however many months I've been here. So very interesting. Other than that, that's about as busy a week as uh, I can report. So uh, everybody stay safe, especially be another storm coming in. Uh, maybe tomorrow maybe. night, a uh, little bit of ice maybe or something, but, you know, be mindful. Uh, watch out for one yeah, another. Hopefully it so. will stay warm above yeah. 32. Yep. Uh, so. All yeah, right, that's it, Ed. Back to you. I appreciate it. Um, the uh, ceremony on Sunday was uh, pretty impressive. Um, Stephen did a great job. Uh, it was very Thank you. professional and very personal. Um, and unfortunately, we're put in those positions, and it's, it's really sad when those that never worn a uniform believe they know what it's like, and uh, they don't. And sometimes, sometimes you just want to hear from the phone, thank you, <laughs> and sometimes you just want to hear, I'm sorry, but those that think they understand and they don't I'd rather than just keep your mouth shut and um, those men and women in fire in red and blue uh, very powerful and the president just moved 3,000 more soldiers over to Europe uh, and as they raise their right hand putting themselves willingly in harm's way let's keep them in mind um, Regardless of the decisions of our commander in chief and others, it's those that are on the ground that we got to continue to recognize. So I, I appreciate Steve, you bringing that up, um, and you did a phenomenal job. Uh, Thanks. The state of the county is on February twenty second over at the uh, art center. I look forward uh, to the opportunity to share our insight and thoughts on what we believe is happening in the state of the county or happening in the county. Um, and uh, participating in that, having it televised and, and, and pushed uh, for everybody, we'll make sure we get it out there. Um, the next day, we have a joint meeting with the Board of Education on the 23rd in the afternoon. Um, looking forward to that as they're getting their budget um, situated. I know Commissioner Weaver attended the Board of Education meeting yesterday. Uh, a lot of um, extracurricular activities I think that we all participate in in making sure that the county is represented and our county government is represented in all these boards and uh, you know um, commissions and councils. Speaking of which, Commissioner Weaver, I really appreciated uh, his forward thinking in recognizing our veterans and it's starting to shape uh, where we're going to have a veterans event on May 15th. Now it seems still a far ways away but it really is right around the corner with all the logistics necessary. I'm working with the U.S. Army Field Band uh, to get them on board and it looks very uh, promising that that's going to happen. We will invite our governor uh, along with uh, the staff and the delegation, uh, both state and federal, to attend, along with the, most importantly, veterans within our community. Um, the target is those veterans that are 30 to 60 years old, um, but it's welcome to all veterans. And 30 to 60, what I'm sharing is the post-Vietnam, believe it or not, <laughs> veteran community uh, is now 60 to 70 years old. Um, so we're looking at that and their families. Um, there'll be activities for children, there'll be activities for adults, uh, food, beer, music, lots of things. So just more to follow on all of that. Um, <clears throat> we are gonna go into uh, our legislative update and then we're gonna have a COVID update from I believe uh, Ms. Sue Doyle or Dr. Wack again like you shared, Steve, I really appreciate uh, Mike's work down in uh, Annapolis, keeping us aware uh, legislatively of all the activities happening, as well as um, 
Sue and Dr. Wack on the activities happening regarding COVID-19 as it's still unfortunately with us. I believe there were 10 deaths in the last week here in Carroll County. Numbers may be going down, but it's again embarrassing when people put their head in the sand thinking that it's just gonna go away. We've all got to work together, uh, I believe. And again, I don't want to preach about it, but I'm looking forward to not having to wear masks. I'm looking forward to not having mandates uh, that are appropriately put in place. Um, I'm looking forward to a lot of this, and I think working together, um, we'll get there. And, uh, you know, uh, sooner than later, if we all put the oars in the water rowing in the same direction. So, okay, no more preaching, I apologize. Mike, why don't you uh, get on, you're on, and uh, share with us, it'll shut me up, and uh, <laughs> share with us what's going on in That's Annapolis. That's <laughs> yeah. Hurry up, Mike, oh. quick. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. It's good to see you all in the same room. We're making progress. That's great. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to move through this quickly. Uh, there's you mentioned, Mr. Frazier mentioned the, the marathon we had yesterday. We could do that every day, but I'll try to move through this pretty quickly. A lot of this will be just quick updates on things that I've presented to you before, and uh, perhaps there's been a development or, or hearing schedule or something along those lines. Um, and, and I'll know one one error. Um, I've, I've made a mistake on the bill introduction date. So the Senate bill introduction date is February 7th. The House bill introduction date is February 11th. It follows the Senate. And that's the date at which uh, bills that are submitted after that date have to go to the rules committee. Uh, it's a formality, but it, uh, I guess it gives leadership the opportunity to either move something along or not. Uh, redistricting, uh, there have been some changes there. Uh, of course, the, the bill and the maps have passed both chambers, so they are law. Uh, the challenge is uh, there are going to be or are legal challenges to it. Uh, the, the sort of thing you're bumping up against is the, the candidate filing date of February 22nd. So uh, Judge Getty has set forward the timing of this legal process. So all challenges have to be made by February 10th. The state is required to respond to those challenges by the 15th. And then there'll be a conference to schedule the balance of the legal process. And of course, they've got to have uh, some something firm by the 22nd so candidates know what district they are uh, they are going to be allowed to run in. Excuse me, Mr. Fowler, if I may. Is yes. it possible if the Court of Appeals overturns and revises the districts, would the candidate filing date be moved and potentially a primary date <clears throat> be moved? Is that, uh, is there talk about that? Is that legally possible? I, I don't know. I'm not a lawyer and don't play one on TV. It's probably a I, I thought maybe there might have sure. been some buzz about that because I'm wondering what happened years ago when actually uh, Mr. Getty at the time had filed the challenge. I think they moved the date <clears throat> that time, so potentially it might happen again. Yeah, I think the, the primary date is the, is another you know spanner in the works, if you will. If we had a, a typical primary date in September, it might be different. Yeah, so I, I don't know the answer to that. I can certainly look into it. Right, thank you. But, but no, I haven't heard any indications. Uh, I, I would be surprised if the, uh, if, if the challenges stand, uh, and that's just my opinion. So let's see how it goes. Um, so regarding some bills, so as I said, some of these we'll just run through very quickly because the, you've already heard the substance of the bill um, and perhaps maybe there's been some minor changes. So. Um, I, I did want to speak about the highway user revenue bill. This is an administration bill, so the governor is putting it forward. Uh, it Right now, there's uh, the sunset date of 2025 for uh, highway user revenue. This would extend that beyond uh, and, and going forward. It also has a requirement there in there that the counties have to produce reports that, that try to catalog 
what funds have been diverted from the county general funds that would otherwise be used for projects funded by highway user revenue and then a list of projects that have been delayed due to that lack of funding so that may be a bit of a challenge but uh, certainly we like the first part of the bill which restores highway user revenues uh, Senate Bill 298 and House Bill 267 is the, uh, the, the bill to criminalize threats against public officials and hospital staff members. Uh, they have, uh, their hearings are scheduled in the Senate to, on February 8th and in the House Committee on the 25th. Uh, the State Board of Elections, the, the contract bill, so this is the MAKO initiative to codify the 50-50 split on expenses between the State Board of Elections and local boards. Um, those hearings, one has been, no, they've actually both been held. Uh, the Senate Committee on the 26th and the House Committee on just the other day on the, on the 1st. Um, the last initiative was the uh, reimbursement for EMS transport and that committee uh, hearing was held in the House on the 19th. I think it went pretty well, but I think there were some technical issues. I think Commissioner Wance, you were scheduled to testify, but for some reason, some of that didn't come together. Um, the Senate hearings held uh, will be held on the 8th. Um, another one here I wanted to explain. Um, Commissioner Frazier pointed out that my description of this bill was not quite what he understood and as always he was right <laughs> so this is um, Senate Bill 66 so this this deals with um, the ability of the county as an employer to inquire about education credentials so it would prevent an employer from inquiring about uh, a prospective employees level of education um, until an offer is made once the offer is made, then the, the question can be asked. I think the one exception is if this, if the credential is required for uh, licensing. So uh, for instance, if you had to, uh, an engineer that had to be licensed, it would obviously, obviously have to have that degree. So I, I appreciate that, uh, that question last week, uh, Commissioner Frazier. Uh, the family and medical leave bills, there was one introduced we talked about last week, um, which establishes the leave insurance program where it's a uh, funding, a shared funding between the employer and the employee. Uh, that, that bill is, is likely to go away and be replaced by House Bill 496, which, is, which includes the insurance but also creates the, the program. Uh, that's been, the, the sponsor is the chair of the Economic Matters Committee. Uh, this is a bill that's going to pass. A uh, little bit difference in how they describe the contributions. The insurance program will be funded by up to 1% of employees' wages, and then the employer will match that amount by 50%. So this will be a pretty significant hit, um, and MAKO is all over this one, as, as you heard. Uh, Senate Bill 419 is the uh, Opioid Restitution Fund Bill. This uh, appropriates the settlement funds based on the settlement, so codifies the settlement that was uh, reached by all the parties, including Carol on the 21st of January. Uh, workers' Compensation and Occupational Disease Presumptions. There's two bills right now. Uh, the first I think we spoke about, which is uh, re uh, relating to first responders, public safety, and, and healthcare employees. No, uh, no hearing has been yet scheduled. There's a second bill that is directed specifically to 911 specialists. Um, that's come out of the 911 commission, but not part of the omnibus bill. Uh, no hearings have been scheduled in either committee for that bill, uh, but it is being opposed by, by MAKO do, uh, basically on fiscal, uh, on a fiscal standpoint. I spoke to you last week about the uh, 
local state local procurement where it would require it would reduce the uh, times that the state must pay invoices and changes the date at which uh, interest would accrue on that outstanding invoice. It also requires the counties to adopt that position. Um, so the House committee hearing has been scheduled for the 15th. Again, uh, counties are opposed to that. And the other procurement bill was on prevailing wage. We talked about that last week, applying to HVAC systems um, and going forward for the life of the system. Uh, that hearing is scheduled for uh, the 10th of February in the Senate committee. Uh, Senator Hester has introduced a bill, Senate Bill 113. Um, this has to do with uh, basically septic systems. Uh, the hearing was yesterday. Senator Hester has been working with MAKO and a number of, of uh, stakeholders, and uh, she has uh, agreed to amend the bill. Uh, it includes additional staffing for MDE. The, the issue is really about inspections um, and, and MDE is coming under a lot of pressure. I think we talked about it yesterday. It's come under a lot of pressure in this session for its uh, perceived inability or stated inability to, uh, to inspect necessarily and to basically enforce. So there are a couple of bills that, that deal with that. Her bill would, uh, would again increase the funding for additional staffing. Um, and the big change that the bill initially would move this oversight from the Department of Health to Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, that has changed. It will remain in the Department of Health. So that was a, a really good development. Uh, another bill uh, regarding wastewater services, um, this establishes a training and credentialing regime. We've seen this bill before, establishes an oversight board for installers, designers and installers. Um, it will not uh, affect uh, local government employees. So there's been a carve out there. That was a, that was a good, uh, good result. Uh, the task force on recycling policy, we talked about that. Uh, the hearing was in, uh, in the Senate, uh, excuse me, in the House Committee yesterday. Uh, House Bill 220, uh, Senate Bill 221 is the Enforcement Authority Bill. Uh, again, that's what I spoke of, where, where the AG is, uh, is pressuring MDE to step up its enforcement, um, increase fines, adding administrative penalties. Uh, one, one big issue that we take is that um, it removes the word willful in there, and it, it also would 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 threaten uh, with uh, some type of enforcement an employee who's just doing their job. Um, so that's that's very problematic, and and Mako is working hard to address those issues. Uh, the PFAS bill was heard in the um, Senate yesterday, and Mako's position has been basically either allow fire companies to use their existing stock or to develop some type of buyback program. Uh, could it, it could be very expensive for companies that still have uh, a stock on hand and can't use it and would be required to go out and not only uh, dispose of what they have, but go out and purchase, uh, purchase new. Uh, mold bill was heard yesterday in the uh, Senate and it's scheduled for a hearing in the uh, House Committee on the 9th. And then, um, Senate Bill 492 and House Bill 649, that's discharge permits. It would limit the administrative continuation of discharge permits and set compliance terms and the enforcement regime, including fines. And again, this is another one that goes to that issue of enforcement. There, there have been apparently some permits that have been extended for very long periods of time uh, without being revisited, and that, that, that's an issue. Uh, for for the AG and some of the advocates, uh, so the the, Sen the Senate committee hearing has been scheduled for the 16th. Nothing yet in uh, in the House. Um, the use of video recording devices in special ed classes. It has a hearing tomorrow. Uh, one bill that 
that we uh, discussed in Mako yesterday is increased funding for libraries and regional resource centers. Uh, this would increase the state share of funding to these entities. Um, it's interesting that almost all of the counties, if not all of the counties, are funding well beyond what they're mandated to fund. And uh, so this push is to try to get the state to step up uh, their, their side of the equation. Uh, House Bill 365, I might have mentioned this one to you last week. This is a, a bill that would uh, prohibit a county, well, it wouldn't prohibit a county, it would allow the county to either construct or replace an HVAC system that was fired by uh, fossil fuels. But if that happens, the state would not consider it a capital expenditure and thus would not fund it. Uh, that's going to be heard in the House Committee on the 15th. Uh, excuse me, uh, heard it on the 8th. Um, in regarding local government, uh, the referendum request bill that was heard in, in the House side on the 18th, nothing yet in the Senate. Uh, the Open Meetings Act, the issue we have with that is uh, a turnaround of two days is, is basically impossible to me. Uh, so that was heard on the 25th, nothing yet, um, ha hasn't gone to the floor yet. And then a new bill we heard yesterday was uh, minimum compensation for election judges. It would set a minimum compensation at $200 per day. Uh, I think they said that right now Prince George's is, I believe, the only county that, that is at that level or above. Um, and the, the request is to um, ask for state funding for that. It's, a, again, a fiscal issue for the counties. Uh, the bill that you asked the, uh, the delegation for Senate Bill 371 is the authorization to conduct a criminal history background check. Um, that is going to be heard on the 9th. Um, this is one that we would obviously need to submit a letter of support uh, so I would ask that you would uh, take a vote and, uh, and give us the authorization to do that. I've prepared some language we can get in front of you uh, and get that into the committee. Will you let me know if you want to do that now or you want to wait until later in the session? Well, moving forward with a letter we can craft and then it would be staffed through us for approval. So I think... Uh, you know, we should be okay, at least, you know, at this point, drafting that letter and using your support and getting the right verbiage in. Um, and then once it's drafted, it'll be, you know, Roberta will staff it through us and we'll make the vote at that point. Would that suffice? Absolutely. Yes, actually it is drafted, so. Okay. Good, we're halfway okay. there. Makes so it even we'll, easier. Yeah, so we'll, <laughs> we'll move forward upon the, uh, upon seeing the draft. Very good. Uh, Senate Bill 352 uh, and House Bill 329. Um, this is a uh, one of the one of the several bills that adds additional delays. Uh, excuse me, additional days for the processing of ballots. Uh, the the election boards ha have sought some relief here because uh, they're concerned that. Uh, the time it takes, the, the, the amount of, uh, early, of of absentee ballots that they will have to compile and tabulate, um, address discrepancies, it's very, it's very compressed. And in order to be able to get the, uh, the process started and, and be able to uh, publish results in a reasonable amount of time following the closing of the polls, uh, they need some help there. So that's what uh, Senate Bill 352 uh, intends to do. And then there is a uh, another bill, the Voter Rights Protection Act, uh, House Bill 538, that adds three additional days to early voting. So right now, early voting ends on the Thursday before the election. This bill would extend it through Sunday. It is cost prohibited, so the counties uh, have agreed to oppose that bill. Uh, moving into public safety, um, 
Senate Bill 57 and House Bill 437, communications and public safety answering points. This would cr uh, criminalize malicious attacks, primarily swatting, which is someone calling in an emergency to try to get uh, uh, a police response. Uh, that uh, was heard on the 19th in uh, the Senate and uh, will be heard on the 9th in the House Committee. And then a second bill similar to that would uh, criminalize false statements and basically interfering with the 911 system. And that one is primarily addressing targeted hacking and cyber threats. I, I apologize, Mike. What, what is swatting? Swatting is when you, you, you call and, um, and, and report a false uh, claim about some issue and in order to, to try to get a police response. So like a SWAT team out there. Okay. Wasn't this on so the national can... news once where someone actually got killed when the police showed up their house or something? I think that's what precipitated yep. this nationally. Yeah. Happened a couple of times. And it, it's basically a diversion of, of law enforcement resources. Right. Okay. Yeah, and can, yes, and can be very dangerous. Uh, Senate Bill 31, that's another one we talked about last week. Um, that was heard on the 19th. Um, this basically just tries to prohibit release of certain sensitive aspects of, of uh, footage. Uh, same with House Bill 162, we talked about that. Still no hearing scheduled on that. That's the one there where the, the state would assume the cost to purchase maintain the, the equipment and uh, also create a state repository for the uh, video footage. Uh, 911 registry program, we talked about that, the mm -hmm. autism, the special needs. Um, the hearing was canceled in house, has not been rescheduled to date. So not sure what's going on with that one. Um, this one, the Senate Bill 12 and House Bill 129, behavioral health crisis response. Talked about this a little last week, where this the, the, the existing behavioral health crisis response grants program uh, will be tied to limiting police involvement mm -hmm. in mental health response. Uh, it was a little rigid, and so so Mako is trying to work with the sponsor to get an amendment, and, and apparently they're making progress to allow a little more flexibility in there. And, you know, the, the counties. The county law enforcement organizations do want to work toward this, but they don't want to be restricted in how they do it. It needs to be done done properly. So, sort of a one size fits all is a challenge for them. Uh, Senate Bill 330. We talked about this one, uh, Senator Reedy's bill that would require you to establish uh, guidance and direction for citations and enforcement by the health department and and require you as the Board of Health to be sort of the, uh, the, the referee on any appeals that would come in. Uh, that's got a hearing in finance on the 8th. <clears throat> and uh, MAKO is going to oppose that, so we don't necessarily have to take a, a specific um, position on that. And then uh, another bill we heard yesterday, Senate Bill 394 and House Bill 408, this is a statewide targeted overdose prevention act. So this would require public and private healthcare providers uh, to dispense noxalone uh, free of charge under certain conditions <clears throat> establishes those, uh, those criteria. Uh, there's a hearing scheduled in the Senate committee and finance on the 17th. No, no hearing yet scheduled in the house committee. And let's see, House Bill 427. Uh, this is one that uh, you agreed uh, with your fellow counties to support with an amendment. Uh, it would uh, criminalize obstructing or otherwise impeding official proceedings of the legislative or executive branches. So as the bill is written, it covers the state executive and legislative branches. Uh, the amendment is to uh, request to include counties in that. And I know Commissioner Wance, you had some questions yesterday. I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on that one. No, I was just, uh, mainly I was concerned that, you know, what, I mean, maybe this is what's good for the goose, it's good for the gander type 
issue. If we're going to do uh, a, a state law to protect the legislative uh, folks and at the state level, then certainly it should be uh, shared with the with the local level. Uh, I was a little bit concerned uh, about who indeed would enforce that. Uh, I, you know, I brought up that if if got to that part of where we were we had an issue with that you know is does a police officer run in the door and take the individual out or whatever but I was assured that this mainly applies to if the state's attorney decided after he saw it he or she saw it that then they would bring charges against the individual so it's more it's it's more to that and not necessarily someone creating a ruckus uh, which is where I thought it was going. So that's the question I had, Mike. So yeah, and they answered that, and I, and I appreciate that. I think it's a good bill, but it it needs to definitely have that amendment that it, it com comes down to our, our level as well at the county levels. Uh, and lastly, uh, the Legionnaires Disease Prevention Act, I brought mm -hmm. that up to you uh, last week. That's the one that would require some type of uh, establishing and implementing a water treatment program uh, through the, the pandemic. Many buildings have been either underutilized or closed. Um, that creates conditions that could lead to the bacteria developing that, that causes Legionnaire's disease. The hearing was yesterday. Uh, Mako again is in opposition because of the, the very high cost of this as it's written. Uh, perhaps there's a a, a better way to go about it that's uh, not just one size fits all like to go to the entire uh, inventory of every county and building. Um, so the only thing I'll mention the, in, in closing is um, next week we'll probably be talking a lot about the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022. This is uh, basically a reprisal of last year's climate bill, omnibus climate bill. Uh, that didn't actually get to the floor. Uh, it just ran out of time. I think there were there were some disagreements between uh, the House version and the Senate version that just couldn't get uh, couldn't get cleaned up uh, before Sine died. So obviously they've been working on that over the interim. There was the discussion early that the House may take a different approach in breaking the bill up in, into pieces. Um, they have issued a climate bill as well. I haven't had the opportunity to dig into that one, but um, this is going to be a big deal uh, because it, it, as we talked about it last year extensively, it gets into uh, uh, energy efficiency and building standards, uh, employment. It, it's a very wide ranging bill. So we'll have a, probably we'll take up most of the discussion next week, I would think. Okay, thanks, Mike. Any uh, comments? Yeah, Mike, I have a question for you. Uh, House, House Bill 162. Do you think it'd be worthwhile for us, it's about the body cameras, um, for us to have a letter of support go in, in with that? Just because if the state is going to pay for the cameras and maintenance and all supporting systems, it would certainly help out the counties to, to, to have this bill uh, move forward. I don't know what you feel about that or what the other commissioners feel. You're certainly free to do that. Mako is, is weighing in on our behalf, but we're certainly free. Uh, there, there obviously wouldn't be any conflict. We would just be supporting Mako. Okay. Uh, yeah. I don't know what you, what other commissioners feel. Should we put a letter of support in or? Got to turn my mic on. I don't have a, yeah, I, that's fine. I mean, if there's value to it, I, then yeah. why not? I mean, yeah. if they're going to, this bill, they're going to pay for the purchase and maintenance and right. the cameras and the, uh, the systems to store them and all that stuff. Right. That's a tremendous amount of money. Absolutely. We're still going to have to pay for the personnel, but that's mm -hmm. fine. But this is more of like a 50-50 split. You know, maybe not, yeah. but you know what I mean. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I don't have a problem with it. The, the, only, uh, the only thing that I would say is a little bit deeper dive, perhaps, because I do think that we all have seen that the that the majority of the cost here is with personnel. That is true. 
That's true. Now, we're going to be able to save some pennies, obviously, with equipment. I, I get that. But if there was a little bit more help on that side of it, and then there was some question about, well, if the state sets it up, how do we get the right how that, do we get right. it back to us us being our state's attorney when they need to to look at it and wouldn't it be better for our local folks to be able to look at this instead of it going somewhere and then coming back and then right. so right. there's a, there, right. there's there's it, some details yeah that the devil's in the details right. with this but and all of that hasn't been worked out from my understanding right clearly yet but I just think it's something we, we could write a letter to support and maybe right. have that put in it. But I think all those things are already going to be mentioned by MAKO. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Let's just make sure that, that, that the language is not in there that would create challenges. And maybe, Mike, you could do a little deeper dive into that to ensure that that's not in there. And, and doing a letter of support also, you know, gets us on the table, you know, right. um, and, and gets kind of our, our nose under the uh, proverbial tent to start having more discussion. So yeah, I think it's a, a good idea. Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's no hearing scheduled for that yet, but I think that that bill is going to be an uphill battle because of the, the state will have to put the money up for it. Yeah. So I think uh, if we could support that, maybe move it along. And I guess we'll leave that in Mike's hands. <laughs> and things always wind up costing more than you anticipate too. I I'm looking at potentially what the state's attorney's office ought to deal with, with all the IT and the compliance with evidence and storing it all. Yeah. It'll get quite expensive as this unfolds. And it's required for us to have body worn cameras by I can't remember next year. No. Twenty five, whatever I think. it is. But yeah. yeah. You know, but so yeah. it's gonna be required, so it'd be nice right. if the state picked up part of it anyway. Yeah, right. It definitely would. Okay, anything else for uh Mike? Chris, do we have any public comment for uh our legislative update yes sir okay thank you so much Mike thank you mr. Fowler so uh, let's move on um, and is it sue or is it dr. whack or Maggie sue, um, yep. sue. okay nope, sue. again <laughs> thank you so much uh, taking the time um, sharing with us uh, you know your thoughts and ideas on what's happening moving forward so Good morning, Ms. Doyle. Well, these things are, good morning, and things are moving in the right direction, so I'm really happy to be here this morning. Um, next slide. So just the same general messaging that we're continuing to send out is even though cases are decreasing, we're still recommending that everybody wear a well-fitting mask in public and around people at high risk, um, avoid crowds and practice social distancing make sure you're gathering outdoors when you can or increasing ventilation indoors postponing travel or gatherings if possible and testing when you're symptomatic um and that's been our biggest issue right now is people are uh, think it's a cold or think it's the flu and they're not really testing for covid so keep going on. so our daily cases are decreasing and our statewide positivity rates down to 7.7 percent which is in the moderate range Hospitalizations are lower than last week significantly, uh, but our transmission rate still remains high. Next slide. So here's the Carroll view. Our data is through the 1st of February. Um, so we've had 389 new positives since last week's report. Positivity rate in Carroll remains in the high transmission rate at 12.9. We wanna see that below 8%. If we get below 8%, for two weeks in a row, then um, we can start removing some of the masking um, requirements. Um, we've had seven deaths since last week's report. Next slide. And this is the Carroll County data of confirmed cases by week. We'd like to see that downward trend. It has come down just as fast as it went up. So that was what the prediction was and that these do not include a lot of the um, over-the-counter test kits that have been sent out are not being reported. Um, there is a report, it's on our website, it's on the state's website to report those. If you do test positive on a home test kit, you should definitely go to the portal, enter your information, especially if you need to be off of work because that portal is gonna give you the opportunity to get the COVID link 
COVID link will send you a, le um, a letter when you're finished your um, isolation, so a return to work letter, so that you don't need to get that somewhere else or go to a doctor. Next slide. Okay, here's Carol's hospitalization COVID data. As you can see, I can't see, but you all can see, I think. Um, the, the, we're trending in the right direction. We had a little bump last week um, in our new COVID admits, but this week we're going down again. New admits that are fully vaccinated um, continue to go down, and the new admits that are not fully vaccinated kind of a, a little level off. They've increased a little bit this week. Next slide. I think we added some new slides this week for you. Um, the ICU and uh, two beds that are being um, used for COVID-19 cases at Carroll Hospital are trending down, which is where we want to see them. And so our ICU bed usage for COVID-19 is looking wonderful right now. And uh, COVID, oh, go ahead. Next slide. Okay. So our COVID deaths, we, uh, you know, this information does lag. So, you know, these, this data is the week of January 23rd through the 29th. And these will change over time, but we're still, we're coming down. We peaked out at 17 deaths in a week, but we're down to six as of um, the 23rd. Next slide. All right. Um, so our COVID-19 deaths by age, this is a new slide this week. Um, the unvaccinated um, since the 26th of December were uh, 36. We broke out the age ranges. We're able to get to some of our data now, which is lovely. So there were 13 people between the ages of 40 and 59. 23 of the individuals that were unvaccinated were 60 plus, um, and the age range was 41 to 92, and the average age equaling 67. Point seven um, are vaccinated but not, not boosted. We're seven deaths. Zero were in the age range of 40 to 59. Seven of them were 60 plus, mm -hmm. and they ranged from 62 to 94 with an average age of 80. Are vaccinated and boosted were nine people admit um, deceased. Um, all of them were 60 plus, and the age range there was 61 to 98 with uh, the average age of about 80. Um, of the 13 COVID-19 deaths that occurred in rest residents under the age of 60 since the week of 12-26, all 13 were unvaccinated. Next slide. I think this is just a bar graph that kind of shows, oh, there it is. So it shows 54.4 as not fully vaccinated of the deaths um, in January 2022 and 11.1 as fully vaccinated. Um, the death rate for the county residents who are COVID-19 positive uh, and died was nearly five times higher. So now that we're able to get to some data, we're able to give you some new information. Total vaccines administered, um, you can see our numbers are going up for fully vaccinated. We're at 71.2%. I believe our, go ahead, next slide. Um, I don't know if we'll put it in here or not. Oh, yeah, we did. Um, the population vaccinated for five to nine, these are not the exact um, age ranges. This is the data we can get to, is it almost at 40%, which is a great number um, to have. And all of our other numbers have increased slightly in uh, fully vaccinated, um, at least one dose, excuse me. Next slide. And our service updates um, for the month of February, all of our clinics are gonna be afternoon and evening. They're all continuing at um, Carroll Community College. They will be Wednesdays from 3.30 to 7.30, Fridays to, from two to five. And I believe they're working on a couple of maybe weekend clinics for um, the five to 11. Testing remains at the Ag Center Monday through Thursdays from nine to one. We continue to have uh, the National Guard out there assisting us. Test kits uh, were sent out this week through the libraries. Um, they're still very limited. Uh, you can still go on and order from the federal government, although I will share that I ordered mine 15 days ago and I have not seen it or seen an alert that it was on its way. Um, you can see um, masks were, dis were distributed through the libraries. I believe there were 7,000 masks pushed out last week and also area pharmacy chains should have them, uh, Walmart, Walgreens and CVS but it does vary by location. So we're asking people to call first before they try to go out and get those. 
we will continue to um, order masks and push them out um, through um, the libraries and through some other sites as we go. That's the last slide, I think. So do we have any questions? Okay, thanks. Uh, Chris, if you can take down the slides, um, bear with me. Okay, a couple things. First and foremost, Sue and your entire team, thank you. Uh, the um, vaccine van or whatever, the offsite um, uh, effort done at the uh, maintenance center, I believe went extremely well and uh, very positive results of those uh, wanting to get vaccinated and given the opportunity. Um, so again, uh, sometimes, you know, getting the horse to the water, they will drink. And that's kind of what happened on this one. And I uh, really appreciate um, the county and the county government recognizing the importance of vaccinations uh, and doing what's right. Um, you mentioned the mask mandate as far as percentages. What you were, I believe, referring to was the state, you know, understanding about mask mandates. Currently, mm -hmm. Carroll County does not have mask mandates to the public. We never have, and to this date, we don't. Uh, unlike Howard County and Anne Arundel and all the others that surround us, Baltimore County, uh, they do. So those that say that they are different than we are and they're more conservative, that's not. We have a mandate in place for government facilities at this time. Um, what I'd like to do is open this up. We could do it open admin, but I think it's appropriate because you're on and you could be a part of the conversation. The state of emergency was lifted uh, by Maryland and we have ours still in place um, with the understanding. What? We don't have a state of emergency. We don't no. have a state no, of emergency. No, we don't have a state no, of emergency. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I we, we were the, underneath the, state the states. Right. I, I apologize. The state of emergency was lifted in Maryland. Um, the question is, the only mandate that we have in place right now is masks in government buildings. And with the numbers the way they are, you know, uh, understanding the risk associated with taking that off the table. I know Harper County recently did, um, but they're the only ones. Um, but it's my recommendation to my colleagues and to you, Sue, is that we lift that off the table and do away with mask mandates in government buildings. Um, I'll open it, I mean, Steve. So the positive benefit. Yeah, I know, I know. The, po the, the positivity rate is still, Sue, what, what did you say the positivity rate was again there? Did, remind us of that. So Carroll County's um, positivity rate, I believe, is twelve. Is twelve point nine. 12. Twelve, and you and you had said that you you wanted to get it below what? So the recommendations from the CDC are that that we could drop masks, masking in public places for social distancing, no more under eight percent. Okay. For two weeks, non transmission. Right. But we don't have them in public places. We right. Just have it here. Right. So, so I. I do think that we're getting closer here to where we should make uh, some sort of a, a decision here. Uh, I also think it's a, it's very important that that we continue. I don't want to. I don't like mandate. I never really did. Right. But strongly recommend uh, visitors to this building, especially uh, those that are coming. I, I, was in the lobby for a while yesterday. I've, I've been known to hang in the lobby here. Um, Does that make you a lobbyist? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, and I was watching people in and out, and all of them were very respectful. And mm -hmm. because there's a lot of folks that are paying their tax bills, mm -hmm. is why I was standing. There. I was standing down there for other reasons. It was a little bit of a ruckus, but anyway, um, wasn't anything major. Uh, anyway, it, it was it was good to see the folks that are doing that. So I still think we should strongly recommend. Right. Uh, those that are coming into our building and uh, if our employees 
are comfortable when they're interacting with the folks like permits and what have you. The collections is a little bit different because they're sort of behind. You can't even, they're behind and there's only a little place to, I hate to use scoot because you're going to look at me. It's all good. <laughs> to put their thing. So I think they're, you know, they're probably in fine shape. So I think if you're comfortable mm -hmm. in your work area, um, I think it's I think we're, I we're, we're good okay. uh, but I also think we should continue to strongly recommend yep. visitors to this building to yeah. to have them on and perhaps if they're in a meeting with our staff mm -hmm. our staff can say hey you know I'm good if you want to yep. take that off uh, you know and, and it's so the same. I, it's I, sort I, of a hybrid yeah it's it's not but it's sort of a hybrid method here I don't want to go all in right and think okay we're done let's go no nope. I want to continue to make, be mindful here because I, agree. I, I think it's important to do that. We're not there yet. Right. We're this close. So I don't want to take our foot off the gas yet. So I, that's, I, I, that's what I would like to, I, to I do. I agree. And I think in addition, strongly recommend to our employees and our workforce, right. if they feel comfortable and wearing a mask, you know, I, I'm it, noticing more in shopping centers and those that are out there, they're wearing masks. Yeah. Um, because they feel more comfortable because they want to get rid of this crap. Yeah. And the, I agree with them. The, the only thing when it comes to our buildings where I have a little bit of a issue is in our libraries. I, I got to be clear. The, the they make their own decisions. Do they? Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's fine. They make their own decisions. Yeah. Because it's always been under the assumption that there are buildings. So they you are know. Our buildings, but early on the board said. Okay. Say, As long yeah. because yeah, people go in there. We've done. We've yeah, they followed. They did. Yeah, that's. They yeah. did. That you know people go in there and they linger yep. for long periods yep. of time. You know, here in this building, unless you're in an hour meeting or something, yep. you're in and you're paying your tax bill. You're in. You're out. So you you all, you're really not even under that 15 right. minute exposure area if right. you will but in the libraries that's a little bit different so I don't know if we could if we could carve some sort of a you know best practices common sense usage sure thing here sure I, I, I think I think that's a good idea and I think uh, if we lift this directive about masks in government buildings with that put in place we are taking risk uh, because the county is not below the 8%, although the state is, uh, and it's still, we still need to encourage vaccines. I mean, we're getting there. We're doing really well, but w and I don't want to slow that down. But, you know, I think uh, right now it's the right thing to do, and the, the risk uh, is out, you know, is there. Um, the, the other but, thing, Ed, yeah. and I hate to keep no. Gap in here, but I think we should still continue to put an emphasis on limiting people in our meeting rooms mm -hmm. and being very mindful of what the correct uh, number of folks are allowed in our rooms, specifically here and in the Reagan room. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we should continue that and still provide the ability to be hybrid for those that wish to do that absolutely so all of that I mean I know that's a lot but I'm no, just I, I I'm trying to, to get a happy medium here I think that's will, fair instead of that, here to, you know trying I, to, I think I uh, a hybrid is is important because there are folks and I want to respect those but um, I do know we have a caller on but I want to get through us before I have to say I agree with everything you're saying Except I think we should wait till next week, just because it's 12.9 percent right now. That's just my opinion. I, I realize I'm in a minority right now, but we just have to get it out there. Well, I'm I not, do agree with everything you're saying. Yeah, I'm not so sure you're in the minority, Dennis. I would, I mean, I would go so far as to say beginning Monday, or, or something, or Tuesday. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just the numbers are going down, and they're going down consistently. I just think one more week they'll be down exactly where we. So you're thinking them. next Thursday? Yes. Well, if I may, if, if you don't, I, I mean, 
we all can discuss it if you want to wait till Monday. I'll be happier with Monday than I am today. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the thing is, to me, we went from 1356 to 474 in the last two to three weeks. Right. That is an incredible steep. Um, and but, but it doesn't show any indication that there should be a... But yet we don't want to mess with that. Oh, I know. I know. But, but I mean, I, I think it's, it's such a, a steep that... I don't think we would, because all we're doing is controlling this right. facility. We're, we're controlling a thousand folks, give or take, um, and that's not going to change this. Um, we we do right. not, You're right and, and you know what I mean. We do not mandate the public, and right. that's what. Right. So we're talking about this. No intention, but I'm just saying for our buildings, for our employees, for our people. I'd feel better doing it next week. I understand. That's just my opinion. Okay. And you guys yep. can uh, Can I add it. something for you all? Last week's last week's transmission rate in Carroll County was 15.9. What was this it? Week's is 12. So okay. 15.9. Okay. Right. So one from so I, I just thought that might add some value to No, I appreciate that Sue. That, that's important. Yeah. It went from 15.9 to 12.9. In one week, again, we're talking general population of the 170,000, not this, although it's, it's a microcosm, but I think we are doing much better being vaccinated here, here. internally. Right. So we're safer, and we're really proud of that, that we are setting an example. You know, and again, Sue, you're leading that charge with your team. So if you had the same change numerically, not percentage wise, right. you'd be closer to that 8% yeah, rate. Right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, so, it, it would be, but let's remember now, that's the county. Yeah. We're, we're right. talking right. about here. Right. Yeah. That's where I'm, just, I'm yeah. well, Okay. Well, my, I think we might have a little bit of a lag in the numbers. I think it was alluded to earlier. So actually, right now, our numbers might be a little bit lower, but haven't shown themselves so in, in their data. And I, I like the points that Commissioner Wayans made. I think for a long time, we will see senior citizens coming in here building mass, and rightfully so. They have a lot at stake, and I think it's best for us to respect those wishes of those people who want to maintain their mass and will come in the building if they're senior citizens. Because we see the numbers, you know, the, the fatality rates are up in that most vulnerable sector, and anything we can to accommodate their needs and respect their desires, I think, is a wonderful idea. So. If the motion uh, was made, I'll second the motion, or I believe, or did I didn't make a motion. We're, I'm we're still, not, I'm still yet. thinking. <laughs> um, um, I, but I do think strongly recommend to your point. Yeah. It needs to be, and I don't care what age you are. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, you know, strongly recommend still provides the opportunity for those not to feel pressured, if you will, and that's sort Correct. of where I'm. But I'm. I don't know if I want to wait all the way till Thursday. Right. But if you want to reach a happy medium and let's finish this week and say beginning Starting Monday at 0800 hours, whatever that date is, uh, this is our policy moving forward. I could go for that, Dennis. I'd be happy with that as well. Okay. So before, so I absolutely agree and we can make that motion. Um, I do know there is a caller, so before we get into that, Chris, do we have a caller on the phone regarding this topic? I do not know what topic they are calling in on, but let's find out. Okay, let's. Uh, hold on. New system here is trying to figure this out. This is like phone a friend on that game show. <laughs> With all new systems comes glitches. Okay, I thought this was an expert. Chris, I take it you're still with us? I'm here. I'm trying to unmute the caller. We muted, and it does not allow me to unmute. Okay. They don't, um, they don't have to... That, I'm, that's I'm no fine. expert here. They don't have to star six or anything, do they, Chris? Because that's what I've been trying. No, no, no. Okay, because no, I, I was in a meeting the other day and I had to star six. <laughs> do, do you have them, Chris, like or not yet? Call. You have to do that. No, I, there's no, I can't, there's no way that I can. Okay, so I, I appreciate uh, colleagues, my colleagues, along with Sue, 
sharing the information, and can I would like to make that wait, motion can I that ask, we lift. Can I ask for a couple clarification things before you do? The mind? mask mandate. Go ahead. <laughs> Monday morning. Um, <laughs> wait a minute for discussion. Is that it? No, I'm okay, trying to get there, <laughs> but I'm, you can make them I'm getting the devil eyes over here. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to amend that when you... I haven't finished it yet. Okay, okay, fine. Go finish it. Okay, are finish. Are you sure? You have my permission. Are you, are you sure about that? I, okay, I want to lift the mask mandate yesterday. No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, lift the mask mandate in all our government facilities for those working and entering the facilities. Um, uh, strongly recommending, as Commissioner Wentz shared, and we and we publicized that and put it out there publicly. Effective Monday morning, uh, beginning of workday, or we could go COB. It doesn't matter. But go ahead. Uh, let, Monday morning. Effective Monday morning. Okay. So two things. You mentioned the libraries. Okay. Hold on a second. Oh. You want to make an amendment? Though. Well, 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 no. I'll that's, second that's, it. That's the motion. Do okay. Well, I'll second it for discussion. Okay keeping in the right so order I, okay, here. So therefore, I have okay. a motion, I have a second. Okay. It is now open for discussion. Okay, now. Thank you, sir. All right, we'll keep this I straight. do feel like an attorney over Seriously. here. <laughs> I think you're getting smarter just sitting there. Oh, Please don't go there. <laughs> is, is, is Burke on? Because if that's the case, we're all in big trouble, Wyndham. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> Boy, <Wow. laughs> um, no, the, um, so just two points of clarification. Generally, we don't make rules for the library. I can strong, you know, strongly recommend, I can talk to Andrea and suggest that the board feels Correct. they should still remain masked because people stay there longer. Um, is that okay? Yes. Right. Okay. And secondly, we've had um, a rule for a while that when there are two people, because they can't physically distance, when they're more than one person in a vehicle, that they have to remain masked. Um, do you want to leave that in place, or do you want to eliminate that? <coughs> as you as you call, as I that's call. a great way to. <laughs> it's not it's a great great way to present that. <laughs> no, I, I think honestly, uh, I I would like to lift it. I, I I mean I want common sense to start prevailing, and honestly, those being honest, saying here's the situation. I'm getting in a vehicle with you. I am vaccinated, I am not vaccinated, um, and here's the concern, but I'm, I, I don't want to nickel and dime our workforce uh, in these issues. Yeah, I, so. If I may, I have to agree with that approach. And I also like to encourage people, if you are feeling symptoms, you know, be aware of that and refrain from coming into work or getting in a vehicle. Because at this point in time, none of us know. I had a head cold over a month ago. And nowadays, everyone's so full of anxiety, you get, you get a, the sniffles, you're worried you have COVID. But if you do have any symptoms, be very acutely aware of your symptoms, even though it might not be COVID. Know that before you get in a vehicle or express out people or wear the mask or don't come in. There's a lot of individual responsibility here that's going to be placed on us. And I want everyone to be aware of that. And I think that's what Commissioner Rothstein was alluding to. We all have an individual responsibility here. Any other discussion on this? Go ahead, Chief. Can I amend your motion? I second it. Mm -hmm. You can ask. I, I just, if you I. You can ask me to amend it. Okay, Go well, ahead. If, if, if you would add to it to continue to limit Please. the amount of people in our meeting rooms based on the. the uh, Ability the, to separate. Yes, because I, yeah. I don't want any of this yeah. stuff to slip through the cracks. Yeah. I don't want 45 yeah. people sitting yeah. in the Reagan room at a yeah. at a planning and zoning meeting. It just we can't do that. Whatever the whatever the limitations is in these rooms, it's got to be enforced. That's a particularly difficult one. I understand that, but then exactly. they wait in the hall until they until their part of the hearing is is there, but not to sit in there and linger. And if that's the case, then everybody's masked. Because what's the difference between that and the library? Right. What exactly is the parameters or the, the limitation? Six the foot. Six feet. Wide. Six feet. Six feet. Yeah. All okay. the all the rooms are posted. Yeah. Right. So, so I, okay. It, it, yeah. It's, and, and the fact is, you know, 
I, I agree with you, and, and, and the reality is that there are only a couple of times and opportunities where you're going to get those crowds. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I agree, but so but, yes. But when we did this before, yep. Yep. there was like 25 people yep. sitting in a planning and zoning meeting, and yep. 20 of them didn't have to be there until right. you right. know it was a it was a spectator sport. Right. They didn't have to be there until their particular case. Right. So if it's not exceeding the amount of people based on the six feet, fine. Yeah. But if it is, exactly. somebody's got to wait in the hall. We could also try to analyze what is on the agenda and possibly spread it out. Over That's a, fine too. Over, but you know, yeah. either another yeah. day or yeah. another the next ta next right. meeting to right. try to instead of having you know, back-to-back -back meetings that we think might have, you can't always tell, but if you can, if you have a sense that okay. this meeting's gonna have 100 people and this meeting's gonna have five, right. well, you know, maybe you do it. I, I wanna make sure we're uh, sticking to uh, Robert's rule or Richard's rule or somebody's rules, right. and so <laughs> I agree with that amendment, and I will uh, include that into the motion. Okay. Uh, you'll second. So just bear, bear with me mm -hmm. before I open for discussion. Um, we have a caller also on. Um, Chris, is that caller unmuted? And is it a topic? Is it this topic they want to discuss? Let's find out. Caller, you're unmuted. Can you please tell us your name and what topic you're here to call on? Uh, James Miller, and yes, it's on the topic of the mask mandate. Okay, you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. I appreciate all the comments today, and, and I know. Um, this board has, has heard from me many times on this topic. Again, so I, I apologize. I uh, say, say your name and where you're from uh, one more time. Yep, James Miller in Manchester. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, James. Yep. So, um, you know, like I said, I've, I've spoken to the commissioners many times, come to many meetings, and I just wanted to call in. And, and first, thank you for, um, you know, I, I know the motion is to lift the mask mandate in the county buildings, and I thank you for that. Um, one topic I wanted to kind of bring up, and, and I would, I'd be curious, um, if the, the um, health department is willing to speak on it, you know, what's going around now, and, and you hear many of the experts, including Leanna Wen and uh, you know, Dr. Gottlieb and, and other folks who are very pro mask are talking about one way masking and providing the government has provided and has continued providing the KN95 and N95 for folks. Um, you know, one of the things that is coming up now is allowing people to make that individual choice by providing them a mask that will actually protect them. So, um, so the reason why I'm calling today because I, I figured you guys were going down this path and um, I just want to make sure that, you know, um, there, there's options out there that will allow people to safely protect themselves by allowing for that individual choice for those who, you know, especially like us who are fully vaccinated, have done the right thing, are ready to move on. Um, the governor spoke last night and said it's time to learn to live with the virus and um, learn to move on. So, um, you know, that was kind of why I was calling it today and um, also wanted to, to bring up again, and I know I brought it up in the past. I would absolutely love if this commissioner, this board, would support the local board of education in um, working with the state to allow that same choice to be made for our students in schools. Um, I know you guys have sent a pass. It's not your jurisdiction. It's not your decision. Um, but I think it means a whole lot for the county to be united in this front. Um, so while we're talking about this lifting of mask mandates, um, it would be wonderful if this, this board would, would openly support the board of education working with the state to allow Carroll County Make that decision for their students um, and uh, allow our kids to also have the same benefit of um, having that option to, uh, to, to wear masks or not. And, and the same thing goes one way masking. Provide this can 95 allow people to protect themselves while others have the freedom to make that choice. Um, that's all I had today, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do is stick to this decision um, and the motion and now seconded to move forward on that if we want to then have a discussion on you know the schools and other things and he mentioned Greg Gottlieb and whoever else we can do that in open admin um, but I don't think it's as necessary I to talk question. about that now what I want one more question before you vote <sighs> I just need to clarify yes they're all little pieces and parts to the organization yep, so please. I want, want to make it right senior center Currently, seniors are required to mask in the senior centers because they're in government buildings. Um, previously, we 
required them to mask when they couldn't be socially distanced. Mm -hmm. That was the same rule we had for the vehicles. Mm -hmm. But same. you eliminated the one for the vehicles for staff, so I don't know what you want to do with the senior centers. I believe uh, as long as they can socially distance, you know. Yeah, the, 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 the challenge comes in here, and I know in, in the Tawny Town Senior Center with the card playing and stuff. That's the, yeah. So the pool I think cards. it's common sense here to say that if the, the same that we're talking about with limiting folks in this room or whatever room here, mm -hmm. if you're in a setting where you're not six feet apart, which you alluded to, Ed, mm -hmm. then you got to have a mask on. But to come in the door to get a meal or right. or to whatever right. it is that they do, you right. know. But if you're in bing, you know, bingo, sitting side by side or whatever, playing cards at a card table should continue yeah. to be it, masked until I, such I time that we decide that they can. And uh, you know the um, the card playing is the Don't have to. is the big one. It <laughs> so is, I but mean, you know and, what? And I know, I, I I know, and I hear it. Um, but I agree, unless you're able to socially distance, right. then you should be, and you will be, in mask. If, if I may, I, I think you made a really good point. Could we see further data? Could we have this this uh, this restriction be for 30 days to be reviewed in 30 days? In light of the numbers dropping the way they are, would sure. we do it, say, for 30 days to force us to come back and look at these numbers again? I, I, don't, I don't think all, it's necessary. No, with all respect, I don't want to put a time period on right. it. Uh, right. I think we should continue to hear from the health department, yep. and we'll make that decision accordingly. Yeah, exactly. Because honestly, look at it on the other side of the coin. If the numbers are down in two weeks and we put yep. it for 30 no, days, then we need to go back that's and rescind right. that. So let's just do it as we see fit. I, I absolutely agree. I and, uh, that. and like I shared, uh, we all want to get out of this, you know, and knocking on wood, we're going to. So if it's a one week or two weeks, that's great. Sounds reasonable. You know? So, okay. Is there any further discussion, Ms. Wyndham? No, I'm. I'm Are you I sure? I think I have all my answer, questions answered. Thank you. And okay. you did say as of Monday, February the seventh, correct? Yes. Okay. That's, as of yep. Monday, February the seventh. Okay. Beginning business. You good? As far yep. as I okay. I have a motion. I have a second. All discussion I think has been had. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Okay. What are you doing? Uh, I said aye. Okay. Okay. Four zero. Thank you, Ms. Doyle. Very much. And that includes the amendment as well, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That was yep. amended. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Have. Thank, thank you, Ms. Doyle. Thank you. And, and again, the key also is to me. We talk about mandates. We never put mandates in place in the public. And somehow, again, your favorite topic about social media, <laughs> it gets spun out of control that we are, you know, the most liberal Republican county in the world because we have, and we don't have mandates. Well, you know, so to, to, you, know you, you guys hear me talk about social media all the time. Uh, the late, great Betty White, I think, put it really well, in case you didn't hear what she said. Uh, a month or two ago before she died, she said, I never knew what Facebook was. Yeah. And when I did, what a waste of time. Yeah. She died. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'd like to address... Uh, you see that special? I watched some of it. I taped the rest of it. Okay. Yeah, I okay. apologize. We have a hot mic somewhere. Got a hot mic. Ed, I'd like to go good. ahead and do it Please. now with um, the talk about the Board of Ed. Okay. There are parameters that have been set by MS by the by the Maryland MSD. State Education yep. that allows for jurisdictions mm -hmm. to be able to do uh, to to be able to make a decision on their mask based on the parameters. Mm -hmm. Leave it at that. We are not here to get into that debate, and I will not get into that debate because that's what the state has set up, and I don't want to. I I think. From what I've seen of those parameters, they've allowed the opportunity when the numbers say that they can to be able to make that decision. And I'm not in, in favor of doing anything based on what they have in place. Okay. Thank you. So collectively, 
your recommendation is collectively we do not engage in making recommendations or decisions that is the responsibility and authority of the Board of Education. If there weren't parameters in place, then I, we, we could perhaps it. talk about it. But there okay. are clear parameters that have been set by the state. Yep. Leave it at that. Okay, and we do have a liaison on the Board of Education that does share and have the opportunity to share what the decisions being made by the Board of County Commissioners. So, okay, any further discussion on that? Let's move on. Good discussion, good action. Let's talk about Burke. Burke, what's Burke? 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 There is no Burke. <laughs> we have a library. <laughs> no, we, we don't have a Burke. We have a workforce development. That's right. But we don't have a Burke. Go ahead, Jack. Hi. What do you want to talk about? Commissioners, it's Heather. I think I'm going to start this okay. morning, but my camera's so not So Heather, just yeah. Kidding. Well, I'm not sure what yes. Burke is, but I thought you were in charge of the workforce development. <laughs> I am. I okay. am. So just a little background. <laughs> I wanted to go back over. Um, in last July, we were established as an independent workforce area of the state, and now we're governed under a new board of directors. So as the local workforce development agency, we're seeking to reestablish ourselves with a new brand as Carol Workforce Development, um, formerly the Business Employment Resource Center, Burke. Um, with the launch of a new logo and marketing campaign. Okay. Um, our logo's up and we have chosen the tagline leveraging success. We think it speaks to the importance of partnership in workforce development. We have several um, core partners that we work with, but also community partners are key in, in making this all work cohesively. Um, Carroll County has a strong reputation of partnership in all that we do. So this just um, continues that. Okay, uh, Heather, is there a, uh, a purpose to the design uh, with the green triangle and the, uh, the blue? It's a fulcrum. It's a fulcrum for leveraging success. Um, that was so we also, obvious. <laughs> is it? Is it? And, and we think that it also looks like a pathway, a career pathway perhaps. Um, this is why I'm not in um, design graphic design uh, we liked the, the green um, interspersed in the color of the logo we feel like it speaks to growth it speaks to green industry money perhaps okay so. sounds good so uh, Jack is there something you want to add to this or uh, no it's a, it we've been talking about this for years and it it distinguishes us from, we're not an unemployment office. We are a workforce development, and I'll go into some of the charts. So I'm excited about it, you know, and Heather's done a tremendous job, you know, along with Denise Beaver on this. And, you know. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree, uh, Heather, you have, and I like, uh, my understanding is that the board, uh, the workforce, is, they've had at least one meeting. Um, yes, our next meeting is coming up. Um, yep. February 16th and so we're moving right along um, yeah. we have a, an excellent representation on our board uh, we do have a lot of work to do establishing this new board so yep it's challenging as long as you uh, leverage um, the State Department of Labor and uh, their workforce development you know team because you know I'm on that board and uh, absolutely Mike Giacomo um, and his folks you know uh, are there for you so let's make sure we leverage them but you're doing fantastic we, as well as you. that board so I appreciate all the work um, good and, and Mike will be making a presentation to one of the future board meetings as well. okay uh, and that's awesome uh, miss Powell you have an extremely satisfying job and you have a tremendous impact upon people's lives in the future, will it be possible to bring any people before us who could testify and give examples about the impact of your service to show people the service that is provided and how meaningful it impacts their life? I would love to do that. If they are willing to, yes. Um, we do, we're putting together as part of our outreach program some of the su success stories that we've had recently, so yes. I very much appreciate this because I know that both Citizen Services and your department 
Pride has the most meaningful direct impact upon our citizens' lives, uplifting them to a higher standard of living, and I look forward to it. Thank you. Um, um, one thing I would like yeah. to mention while I have the mic is um, we are continuing our rapid welding program. We have our third cohort starting um, February 14th. And then we've also, we're going to bring, we've contracted with Carroll Community College, we'll be doing um, a CDL training right here in the county. Typically um, training occurs either in Hagerstown or Baltimore County. So to have it in our county, I think will make a difference for people to be able to attend that training. That is wonderful. We all know that the CDL is very important right now. So that's addressing our community's needs. Yeah, you don't have to drive to get the CDL. <laughs> hey, Heather, I had brought this up a, a week or so ago. Uh, if, if you could make sure, maybe you already have. Uh, the, uh, the, the fire departments uh, are, are required as well to, to get their drivers um, that course now. It used to be that they didn't have to do that, but now they do. If you could reach out to CC Visa, if, unless you already have, to develop that um, ability to have our folks here in the county that want that course to provide that to them as well, that would be great. I will definitely follow up on that. Thank you. Okay, with okay. that, I'll make the motion the Board of County Commissioners accepts the recommend, recommend of rebranding, including the logo and tagline of the Carroll Workforce Development Center as presented. Second. I got a motion and a second and never to be called Burke again. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, you. Heather. <clears throat> now let's talk about the AARP Age Friendly Community Initiative. Jack, you can go away. Uh, we, wanted, we wanted to talk to you about um, our job fair um, that we had. Um, give you some, I think you have a slide. Chris is going to put a um, slide up for you. Okay. If you have a minute. Sure. Um, nope, time's up. <laughs> um, Chris, do you have a slide you want to share? Can you see it? We can. I'm going to uh, get it better in a second. It's a blur to me, but I, I have a printed it's copy. Blur to us as well. Uh, let's just go over it with there you. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, you talk about commissioners. Uh, economic development changes lives. When you, when you talked about, uh, you know, our marketing program has been manufacturers, and we we have we we have about four prospects right now, uh, manufacturers that want to come here. And the number one reason is is our labor force, uh, very well qualified, um, high productivity, and low turnover, and we change lives. People, you know, out commuted from the um, community um, and they um, they now can work here. They can go to the soccer games and go to the program. So uh, economic development and one of the big engines, the engine is of course, you know, our, our employment center. Um, we had a job fair on the 25th, a virtual job fair. Um, we had 30 employers that were on the line with us. Um, we had about 145 jobs that were, um, that were outstanding. Um, we had 60 people attend the, the job fair, including 10 veterans, uh, Commissioner. Um, and we had uh, 20 new p potential customers we never saw before. Um, 50 resumes were submitted. Scott's following up on the um, on, on how many people were placed on that. But we can tell you on the welding program, we have been placing the people, Commissioner, that, that went through the welding program, we have been placing them on that. We're going to have another job fair on the 24th from 10 to 11:30, um, and HR is going to be on there. Our HR department, because I, I looked and we had about 30, um, 30 job openings. So we're going to we're excited about you know this this venue how we do it on February 24th, and on a sidebar too, our unemployment numbers came out uh, yesterday for December, and we're still number one um, in the whole state of Maryland. However, this is the first time I've been tracking it that we're under 3,000 people that are unemployed in Carroll County, um, 2,751 um, people. And a lot of it is because they go to the center and we do these 
virtual job fair. So we've been really aggressive uh, with this. And of course, you know, every company you see signs, but, um, you know, Heather has done a tremendous job, her and Denise um, and her staff um, to get people registered and, and have, you know, get them out there. So we're, we're really excited about the work that she's doing. Plus we, we can control it now. That's all I have. I didn't want to take. I wanted to take a minute and tell you that our, our successes, Heather's successes, on this. Absolutely Thank you very much. appreciate it. Um, good stuff. Yeah, and I'll sign off now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, all Jack. Right. And I think uh, Gina could take you, or at least Celine. So I see Celine. Is Gina yeah. coming on? And yes. I saw um, Jim McCarran was on. I don't know if he's going to pop on or not, but we want to talk about the. AARP Age Friendly Community Initiative. And there's Hi. Carol popping in. Hi. Okay. So good, good morning, commissioners. I'm joined this morning uh, by Gina Valentine, our Bureau Chief of Aging and Disabilities, and Jim McCarran, who's the chair of our Carroll County Commission on Aging and Disabilities, and then also Carol Wheatley, who is our co chair of the Commission on Aging and Disabilities. We are here this morning to request approval to submit a letter of commitment and an application to pursue implementation of AARP's age-friendly initiative. Through the support of you, the Board of County Commissioners, Carroll County remains committed to providing a safe community where people of all ages and abilities are able to thrive and also can achieve optimal living. As the number of Carroll Countyans continues to increase, placing our older adults at the forefront of our planning and even our focus could not be timelier. Before I t turn it over to, to Gina to talk a little bit more about the specifics of the Age Friendly Initiative, I did want to um, talk about some highlights of the work over the years that has been done to move us to this place. Through the collaborative work with the Bureau of Aging and Disabilities and their advisory board, the Commission on Aging and Disabilities, over eight plus years has been devoted to really exploring information on aging in place initiatives, as well as age friendly community practices that could be implemented here in Carroll County. Through the work of the Commission on Aging and Disabilities, the designation of an Aging in Place subcommittee was employed, later to be named Carol Together. The initial role of the fo and focus of this committee was to enhance lives of older adults and help them remain in their homes as long as possible. An Aging in Place Community Needs Assessment was later created in partnership with the Commission, the Bureau of Aging, and McDaniel College's Center for the Study on Aging. This was done to identify priority areas in Aging in Place um, the key stakeholders and community members um, had provided input for. The results of that survey just confirmed what we already knew from sim similar national trends in aging, and that is that people want to remain in their homes for as long as possible. And they want to do this through a plethora of um, uh, services that exist within the community and, and resources, including healthcare and wellness, opportunities, outdoor spaces, meaningful civic engagement, social connections, and the transportation to make it all happen. As Carol together further developed their mission, a broader age-friendly community focus began to unfold. In March of 2020, as the COVID pandemic erupted, Carol County's, uh, the Carol Together subcommittee was preparing to make a formal recommendation to you, the Board of County Commissioners, to engage in this AARP age-friendly community initiative. But obviously, that had to be placed on hold um, so we are back before you now, ready to move this forward. So as a result of our ongoing work and continued commitment to older adults in Carroll County, we truly believe that partnering with a the AARP network to pursue this age-friendly community designation is our, nat our next natural step. So Gina will now go through um, and provide us with the detail on how this age-friendly initiative will work in Carroll County. Thank you, Celine. Um, Chris, could you move to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. Um, just to provide with some background first, um, of course, um, the, the, the goal uh, is to make communities more supportive of older adults and people of all age, ages. Um, the, there are um, multiple um, places throughout the state of Maryland that are currently participating, which is um, which are Baltimore, Howard, and Montgomery counties and College Park um, as well. Um, the initiative is a catalyst for educating and encouraging and recognizing the improvements that make cities, towns, and counties more supportive of older adults and, again, people of all ages. Um, next slide, please. 
according to census data, the 60 plus population in Carroll County was 46,424 in 2020, and it's expected to increase to 55,469 um, by 2025. Committing to the AARP um, Age-Friendly Community initiative, initiative, excuse me, will ensure that Carroll County is planning for the future of aging, and it will also strengthen our mission of assisting people with remaining in the community for as long as possible. Um, this slide, the current slide that is up, um, provides information about the um, eight domains of livability, and this slide is um, actually directly from AARP. Um, communities in the age-friendly network are encouraged to work within a framework um, that's re referred to the eight domains of livability. Um, the theory behind this is that what happens in the eight domains has a direct impact on the quality of life for older adults and again, people of all ages. So the eight domains are um, outdoor spaces and buildings, uh, transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, and finally community support and health services. Um, I'm gonna explain more um, in the next slide, the steps of moving forward with the initiative. Um, however, we plan to focus on three to four um, of the eight domains of livability. So there are multiple steps um, uh, for the age-friendly community um, initiative, excuse me. Um, so the, the first step is entering the network and that is where um, a letter of support is provided, of course by we or the Board of Carroll County Commissioners in support of us moving forward. Um, we will then complete and submit an application to join the network um, and we will gather our core team which we actually already have our core team through our Commission on Aging and Disabilities. Um, in addition, we plan to, um, in order to move forward with this first step, is to hire um, a consultant. Um, and we have funding to do so, and which has been approved by Maryland Department of Aging, um, again, to be able to move the initiative forward. Um, the second step is years one through two, and we'll focus on planning. Um, we will conduct a community needs assessment, um, conduct town hall meetings, obtain input from community and key, st uh, key stakeholders, identify the domains that will be the driving force of this initiative, and create an action plan that will outline the activities indicator and indicators that will be used to measure um, the implementation and set goals. Um, step three, which is years three to five, um, will be implementation and evaluation, and we will um, implement the action plan and again, continue to evaluate it. Step four is at five plus years, um, which is a continu continuous cycle of improvements. Um, throughout this entire process, um, we will have and receive um, direct support um, from AARP and guidance from them as well. Um, so before I move on to the final slide, I'd like to invite um, Jim McCarran and Carol Wheatley um, to say a few words. I say once a mayor, always a mayor. Well, that's the truth. You know, th this this effort um, is pretty well universally uh, accepted by our commission. I mean, everybody seems to be on board with this. We've heard several presentations. We've gone to several presentations. We we went to the kickoff presentation down in Howard County a couple of years ago, and was I was very impressed with the uh, with the interest that that was. That was exhibited by the general population. This, this um, first step, this writing this letter saying that we want to pursue this, uh, starts a procedure that you can see to stretch over a number of years, and it, it it's very well thought out by AARP, and they they promise a lot of guidance uh, in their. Uh, in, in, in our efforts to, to develop this for particularly for Carroll County. Uh, you know, the counties that are participating are, are urban counties. We've got College Park and and uh, individual municipalities are welcome to, to pursue this endeavor on their own, but it makes sense for us because of our diversity in, in Carroll County to, uh, to try to develop this as a county rather than have the uh, municipalities go out individually and try to you know, reinvent the wheel. I think that we all can work together to this. I think with, with partnership with the municipalities, 
do do much in helping us establish uh, this uh, age-friendly uh, network uh, in in Carroll. And it's you know it, it, it once this is established, it, it, it's all about engagement. It's all about engagement of the of the senior community with the rest of the community. And um, I think we do a lot to do that uh, that already with with our fine network of senior centers and and support to get from, from the, the commission. But um, I, I think that this is this is something that will really focus our direction and give us some, some um, um, I, I guess, uh, well, it, it'll give us, give us, it'll focus our direction and give us some, some deadlines to meet in order to make this thing happen rather than just talk about it. Yeah, this is Carol Wheatley. I'd like to add to that, that, um, you know, when we were participating in the Carol Together subgroup, we heard, as you've already been stated, um, we heard from a number of the local counties as to what their uh, programs have been and what worked for them and, and what didn't, what challenges they faced. The other thing I should say, too, is that AARP has a tremendous number of resources. They publish a number of uh, books and toolkits and we have the option to reach out to other communities all around the United States to, you know, to get ideas from them to find out what worked, and um, that way be able to uh, be able to use that whenever we're developing our um, our initiatives here. So I really think that it has the potential to um, to engage the community and to be able to in in very um, direct and also subtle ways to be able to make our community much more um, age-friendly and um, more receptive to community, community participation. Great, right. thank you so much, Jim. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, and then if we could just move on to the last slide, the final slide. Um, the Bureau of Aging and Disabilities um, will celebrate 50 years of service to the Carroll County community on April 27th of 2022. Um, and at this event, we plan to announce and celebrate the launch of the AARP Age Friendly Community Initiative. Um, our partners, the Commission on Aging and Disabilities and the Carroll County community, you know, they're so supportive of our agency, the services and programs that we offer. And we believe with their continued support that we will, we will be successful in advancing um, the Carroll County community forward and planning for the future of aging. Gina, thank you so much. And Jim, Carol, Celine, for sharing this with us. Um, a lot happening for all the right reasons and the numbers are moving up as we see in the senior population. So getting in front of it and being proactive like you are uh, especially with the aging and disabilities uh, team, um, committee, council, whatever we call it. Uh, I just appreciate the forward thinking uh, that you provide. So, yeah. If, if I may, I want to reiterate the compliments of Commissioner Rothstein to y'all. I remember when I first came on board, former Director Kay and now Director Steckel made me very much aware of this age bomb, I call it, that's coming at us. And just trying to break down the numbers, what we're looking at now, you know, we showed a percentage of 22 and a half percent of plus 60 age statewide. But right now in Carroll County, we're at 27 percent, projecting within three years, 32 percent. These numbers are exploding faster than I was told three years ago because I didn't think we'd reach that 32 percent until 2030. So this is exacerbating the situation even more. And there's a potential with COVID that birth rates are dropping and that'll make things grow even more. So I, I like, as Commissioner Rothstein said, the forward thinking. We've seen Parks and Rec do something similar, surveying the people to see what their elder community needs for health and their Parks and Recs. So I think this is a prime opportunity and I applaud you all, especially Chairman Mayor McCarran and Vice Chairman Wheatley for being on this board and making this happen. We appreciate your time. Okay, so what you're looking for is a letter. Um, so I'll make a motion that the Board of Commissioners approve the submission of a letter of commitment and submission of application to pursue the implementation of the AARP's 
Age friendly community initiative. Second. I have a motion to second anything to discuss. Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, ladies, and thank you, Jim, for all that you're doing. Let's move on. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. To thank a you. much more exciting topic, not. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Zaleski, why don't you come on in and talk to us about the budget for second quarter of FY22. I think I'm kind of offended. <laughs> uh, don't be offended, but I could barely hear you. Uh, that's because you might be looking at me and saying, why aren't I in my uniform? I'm not feeling well, and I'm doing this from home, and my voice is part of that. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be as strong voiced as I can. So, Ted, you don't wear a tie at home? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do take it off sometimes. <laughs> okay, so on the revenue side, uh, right now, keep in mind, we still have a lot of the year to go, but on property tax, we think we'll come in about a half a million dollars more than when we budgeted. Uh, income tax is a big story. Right now, we're projecting 5.2 million above budget. That's if all the other distributions come in where we have them planned. There's still a lot of uncertainty here, but it's becoming clear we we are, we have seen an increase in, in our base. Uh, our next big distribution is at the end of February. As always, we'll be interested to see what happens there. Uh, it's not time for us to talk about our six year revenue projections yet, but um, we have been working on that and the the last assessment that came in higher than expected and income tax coming in higher than it's continuing to come in higher than expected uh, will lead us to increase our revenue projections. It's too early to say exactly what that picture looks like because um, the total picture, because we're still working on the expenditure side, but, but it will be better looking than what you have been seeing in recent years. Uh, recordation, we're looking at six million in excessive budget. <clears throat> yeah, the story here continues to be the, the hot housing market. And I think we need to be very careful how we think about this. You know, it's, I'm not gonna tell you that I can predict when the housing market's gonna change, but I, but I think we can stay with the confidence it can't continue to go on as it is. Then uh, there's some other small changes, but that, what I just said is, is the bulk of the story. But um, as things stand, we're looking for um, year end to come in about $13 million above what we budgeted. Look at the expenditure side. Uh, Public works, looking at about $1.2 million unspent. Almost all of that is about salary savings. So this is good on the expenditure side, but the problem is we have open positions that aren't out doing the work we need to be done. Uh, a couple other relatively small changes. In general government, which covers a lot of territory, of course, we're looking at about three million, million and a half of that, or half of it, half of that, because of the timeline on <coughs> EMS. So we have money budgeted that we're not yet spending. The rest of it is split up among a, a dozen different things. Reserve for contingency has four point two million dollars remaining. We have spent about six hundred thousand dollars this year. Debt service is about three quarters of a million. Um, <clears throat> that's primarily due to <coughs> lower than planned bond sales. We have to project into the future how much we think we will sell in bonds when the time comes. And uh, in, in this case, we didn't need as much as we had planned. So 
Again, as things stand, expenditures are about projected about $10 million lower than it was budgeted. So <clears throat> a good picture for where, where we are right now. Um, but again, long way to go, things can change. Any questions about our No, uh, relatively good news, uh, albeit short term, but uh, definitely, um, and most importantly, I want to make sure you're feeling better. So uh, appreciate you taking the time and sharing this with us. Any, uh, any discussion on this? Dir Director Zaleski, thanks for the report. You know, you're not the most bubbly, extroverted person, but we all very much care about your health and well-being and wish you a speedy recovery. So go rest. We're, we've held you up too long. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're not done yet, though. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say, there, there's, 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 there's more. more. But so, wait, there's more. It. Any, uh, there's anything else on what's been shared so far? No, I think okay. it's, again, as you say, yeah. it's a, it's, it's good positive news. right it's now. Good it's good news. Picture. And that's something we need as we, uh, yeah anticipate the beginning of what I always call the annual circus because <laughs> it, it all starts soon so uh, you were, you so, were so let's, for a word yeah, well, <laughs> you pulled the right one yeah okay so let's use the uh, term guarded optimism there at you this go. point yeah, let's so. do it. okay go ahead Ted okay we have two res two budget resolutions yep. for you to approve the first one resolution 0 22 10 uh, this is an administrative thing we budget money for health and fringe benefits at the beginning of the year in the HR budget because we don't know how to allocate it yet uh, that allocation has been done so what we're doing here is moving the approximately 11.7 .7 million dollars from the human resources budget to all the individual budgets this is not about additional spending or any change in anything we're doing, just getting the uh, the expenditures slotted in the right place. And I, I just want to mention that this is um, our other post-employment benefits. It's OPEB. It's not all of our medical. Um, so you will be seeing medical come um, at the end of the end of the fiscal year for a year end adjustment. Thanks, Ed. Is this a, a standard um, that we've been doing for years that we put it into the HR coffers and then we figure out, okay, what is the number at this point? Or is it just too difficult yes. to do early on? It, exactly. I mean, we, we could get it approximately right. Right. But what we would end up having to doing would be to adjust a hundred different budgets. Right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, let's do these one at a time. I'll move the Board of County Commissioners approve the operating budget resolution. Uh, is it is that a zero or an O, uh, Oscar? Oh. Okay, oh. Oscar Tech twenty two dot one zero to transfer eleven million six hundred sixty seven thousand two hundred eight dollars twenty six cents of funding from HR benefits zero two five one to individual budgets for OPEB. Second. I got a motion, I got a second. Is there any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Let's go to the second one. Okay, this is a capital budget resolution, C2211. Uh, you've discussed the purchase of the Penmar building a number of times recently. Um, the money that we used to purchase that was in a capital project called Land Bank. Uh, we've now established a project for this building and the buying of it and the work that we will do. We just need to move the, uh, $2 million from the land bank project into this project that is specifically tied to the building. What, what is land bank? I'm lost on that a little bit. It's a place where we keep some money appropriated so if an opportunity to buy property comes up during the year that had not been planned for, that you have a place to go to. Sounds like a rainy day capital budget type it's, of 
we we've had that for quite some time. Yeah. It allows we us have. to allows us to we've we've dipped into it a couple times for the green for the our proposed government site here. Right. So you know, it's just acknowledgement that there are things we might want to act on that come up in an inconvenient timing for us that didn't allow discussion during the budget process. And of course, when this happens, it's usually not fifty dollars that we're talking about, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So this gives you the flexibility to be able to, to act on it when the opportunity arises. Hmm. What well, what does um what does it leave us in that land bank uh, 9002? Is it significant? Uh, no, Deb. I think we have approximately $5 million. Okay. Okay. Here, yeah. I'll make the motion of the Board of Commissioners to approve capital budget resolution C-22.11 to establish a new capital project for the Penmar building and transfer $2 million in funds from the land bank 9002 to Penmar building number to be determined. Second. Okay, I have a motion, I have a second. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Ted and Deb. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's move on to proposal renewal of contractual position of the emergency management readiness technician. And we got Scott and Valerie. Uh, good morning. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you, commissioners. Um, first, I apologize for asking, but I had some trouble signing in to make sure that you can see and hear me fine. Yes. You're good. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't know if oh, that's well, a good thing, but I guess we see that's you. That's debatable. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Scott. Okay. I, I walk right into that. Thank <laughs> you very much. Um, as the brief shares, commissioners, this is, we're here to ask today uh, for a, a proposed renewal of the position that you created, agreed to in May of 2021, titled Emergency Management Readiness Technician. Um, when the initial approval was provided or when you granted it, there was uh, included the, the option to renew, mm -hmm. but because there is a proposed change to the terms of the, uh, the contractual position for full transparency, we're here today to share that with you. That change is simply, instead of the six months as initially, we are asking that we renew it for 12 months, same finances, same everything, simply to do it for one year. And um, Valerie, uh, it can clearly speak to the benefits that have been um, realized from this position if you have those questions. But I, with uh, the difference between six months and uh, 12 months, is there a difference also <clears throat> in benefits provided to the individual or no? It, it's an unbenefited position, commissioners. It's a, uh, it's a contractual position with limited hours. Uh -huh. it, it really that is that the position has been so beneficial as Ms. Hawkins can attest to that both the incumbent is receptive to a longer commitment, and this also gives uh, Valerie the opportunity to, to rely on having those resources for a, a greater period of time. The single most important thing is it's 100% funded by uh, grants, not to say it's a grant contingent position, but that we have identified grant funds that will pay for it. So there is no cost to the county to do this. Just the request as proposed is to renew it, but to do this over 12 months compared to the initial six months that you approved back in May of 21. Right. That is the change. Is it a uh, position that's uh, vacant that we're trying to fill? On the no, books? there is an incumbent. There is an incumbent com commissioner, and uh, an individual has indicated very good that more than willing to uh, renew and for the proposed okay. 12 months, and that's why we're asking you for, for that. Yep. Okay. <phone rings> Make the motion of the board of commissioners approve the renewal of the emergency management readiness technician contractual position as presented. Second. I got a motion, got a second. Any discussion on this? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. You're one for one. Now let's talk about protocol system Aye. maintenance for calendar year 2022, emergency medical, fire, and police dispatch. 
Uh, Scott or Jack, who wants to take the lead on this one? I'll gladly start, commissioners, and uh, if you have a specific questions, Jack's more than uh, prepared to, to answer those. Here to ask for permission to pay the $36,000, and I'm looking at my brief. Yes, I do have the dollar amount in there. The $36,000 for the, the support, the protocol support agreement for, and my term, calendar year 2022, I use that term because it runs literally from early January to early January. So that's why I reference it as the calendar year, calendar year agreement. Um, it is the protocols used in the dispatch center for the pre-arrival uh, and the vetting of calls, emergency medical, fire and police dispatch. Uh, this is an annual renewal and uh, Mr. Brown, I'm sure can, can share with you the benefits and reasons why uh, we have these protocols. Okay, uh, Jack, did you want to add anything to it or? We good. Sure, the, 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 as Director Campbell um, indicated, these are the protocols that the, the 911 specialists use on a daily basis to process the 911 calls. So um, uh, this is where we get our pre-arrival instructions and, and those types of um, activities during the um, processing of, of 911 calls. Okay. And the support and maintenance agreements uh, provides the uh, annual updates and um, those types of things to the software. Right. Okay. And Commissioner, if I may, something that is in the brief that should be noted. Um, this is an expense that is eligible for, and we fully expect to be reimbursed by the Maryland 911 board. Um, it's one of the new expenses, uh, one of the additional expenses or expanded eligible expenses that the numbers board can use the trust fund for reimbursement and mr brown uh regularly submits for reimbursements for these types of expenses that would be the intent and we fully expect the county to be reimbursed in the, in this full amount it's good news it's always good news yep i and love using other people's money there's there's there are good things that come out of the general assembly <laughs> huh. imagine that i move the commissioners authorize the director of public safety to pay the annual fee for the referenced protocol system maintenance agreement. Second. I got a motion second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Thank okay. you, commissioners. Okay, now let's talk about paving and repair at the Farm Museum. And uh, I got Justin, I expect to see Eli, uh, possibly. Um, no? Okay. I'm here. Can you hear me? Who's that? Eli. This is Eli. Okay. Yep. Sorry, the computer's, okay. computer's running a little slow here, but I'm here. It's all good. Did very, you want to start this? Uh, very quickly, yeah, I'll, I'll, President Ross, I have to recuse myself right up front because I'm friends with the owners of Gem Contracting, so I have to sit this out. Thank you. Go ahead, Eli. Sure. The Office of Procurement and Cooperation with the Bureau of Facilities requests your approval to award a contract for the paving and repair of various areas at the Farm Museum to GEMS Contracting, Inc. in the amount of $66,628. The Bureau of Facilities solicited for quotes and received three responses listed below in the amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be needed. Morning, Commissioners. <clears throat> Facilities will be paving the interior roads and walking paths at the Carroll County Farm Museum. Um, that Highlander facilities project manager uh, took the lead on this project. So I'm gonna pass the, uh, the torch on to him to uh, give you guys complete the scope of work of what we will be performing. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, the Farm Museum interior roads and walking paths that lead to the exhibits and other attractions have started to degrade and they're in need of repairs. About 75% of the paths will be overlaid with two inch new asphalt. The edges will be backfilled with topsoil, seeded and strawed. There's a culvert area off the main parking lot that's also made of asphalt that is undermining along with the pipe that runs under the footbridge that'll also be replaced. Um, the rear of the administration building and the gift shop has a degraded ground level wood deck. Uh, we're gonna we propose to take that out and put and replace it with asphalt and also there's a uh, deteriorating concrete on uh, the walk path away from that gift shop. We're gonna replace that with asphalt as well. Uh, the work is expected to be completed by the end of April, 2022. That sounds great. Uh, as long as it stays on schedule, we have, uh, as I shared earlier, 
the intent of having a very large event May 15th, two weeks later. So it's going to be pretty exciting for a beautiful walks and trail, you know, that's redone for May 15th event. Um, okay. Any uh, questions on this one? I do have a question. I was wondering why you're replacing the concrete walk with the asphalt. On the concrete walk in, um, that, that comes out of that gift shop is an old concrete walk and it butts right up to that uh, deteriorated wooden deck. Um, I think it'll be a cleaner pre a presentation, number one, but it'll also avoid any trip hazards that we have when they exit because they go through that gift shop to actually enter the park. Right. So uh, the, the main scope really was to address any trip hazards on these paths or walkways. And there's a couple as you leave that gift shop that we could address wh while we're doing the paths and, and make everything nice and nice okay. and smooth and no trip hazards. All right. I just wanted because in my experience concrete holds up much better than asphalt, but because of the trip hazards in this in the smooth transition, that does make sense then. Okay. I'll, I'll make the, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll make the motion to board of commissioners award a contract for the paving, paving and repair of various areas at the Farm Museum to GEMS contracting the amount of sixty-six thousand six hundred twenty-eight dollars and zero cents. I'll second. Any further discussion? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Three zero one. One abstention. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Now let's talk about the 2023 Consolidated Transportation Plan Priority Letter. I expect to see Ms. Linda and Ms. Mary popping in, or at least Linda, is Mary joining us? Yes, she is. All right. Um, her camera may have some issues. Um, I know she's having some trouble earlier, but she will be presenting. Um, so good morning, commissioners. We good are morning. here for our annual update on the Consolidated Transportation plans priority letter. This is the letter that we send annually to MDOT stating the county's priorities for road projects that are state roads within Carroll County. Um, there's no action needed today. We want to present to you the presentation that we have um, and let you know some of the changes that have happened over the last year. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So if you can give me uh, the presenter ability control room. <coughs> You're now presenter. And can you all see the presentation? Yes. Okay. All right, great. Um, so Mary, are you able to give the presentation or do, or do you need me to um, to do this for you today? Oh. Um, I can do it if you can move the slides. Yep. Sure. Oh, sorry. All right, there you go. Perfect, thank um, you. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary to give you the purpose of the presentation and review the proposal that we have in front of you today. Um, so with that, Mary. Thank you. Um, we're here today, as we are this time every year, um, to talk to you about the State Consolidated Transportation Program County Priority Letter, the CTP Priority Letter. And this is pretty much the same presentation we make to you at this time every year to get started on this. The purpose of this presentation is to review the process with you, to go over the highlights of last year's letter, um, to go over any preliminary proposed changes, timing and next steps, and if you have any questions. So we will need direction from you on a few things that have happened over the course of when we were here last year. So as a reminder, the list of the top state tra transportation priorities in the county includes state highways and roads, the streetscape improvements, county trails, and transit. Um, again, as a reminder, this is our process um, planning staff meets with the town staff late in 2021. We met with all the towns in November and December to talk about this. Then we begin working with the county agencies in January, public works, economic development, recreation and parks. Then the stage we're at now is the board will review and approve the letter in over the next two months, probably three meetings. This usually takes three meetings for us to make sure that the letter reflects what you want to say. Um, then the county submits the letter to the state in April and in between there, Mike Fowler takes it to our delegation to get their support on it as well. And that's followed by the secretary's county tour in the fall where the draft CTP is distributed. 
and then the legislature approves the CTP from the prior year in April. So it's a year long process. Um, these have been, well, the first three have been our highway capacity enhancement projects for a number of years. We have not adjusted the order. Number four was added, I believe, two years ago. Again, we have been consistent, purposely consistent in this um, because that is what has always been suggested to us by the state. So the first one is Maryland 32 from 26, it should be, um, yes, south to the Carroll County line. Maryland 97 from Buckman's Valley Road to Maryland 140 in Westminster. Maryland 26 from 32 east to the reservoir. And Maryland 140 corridor improvements from the county line to Case Mill. I will run through, this is reflective of what is in last year's letter, which you should have in front of you. Again, you only have last year's letter. We have not drafted the new letter, but we use the prior year's letter as a template and we adjust based on what's happened over the past year and any new priorities you may want to add. So again, Maryland 32 remains the county's top priority for new project planning. The project scope is to ultimately widen the roadway from two to four lanes, including pedestrian facilities and other amenities at appropriate locations within the corridor. But as you'll recall, several years ago, MDOT embarked on a planning and environmental linkages study, which we participated in and basically found that that type of improvement was not needed over the next 20 years. So they identified potential improvement concepts to address identified needs at specific locations. And we have had two breakout projects in for the last couple of years. The first one is for engineering design of Piney Ridge Parkway, Macbeth Way, north of Springfield Avenue. And the second one is a breakout project for design funding for Second Street to Main Street. And these were identified in the Pell study as the um, improvements that would need um, attention first. probably very hard to see, but this, this is the scope of this improvement. The second priority is Maryland 97 from Bachman's Valley Road to Maryland 140 in Westminster. It's to widen the roadway from three to five lanes with the full interchange at Meadow Branch Road and pedestrian facilities. Um, last year, what we requested, and this is very important to even get into the CIP, is a breakout project, I'm sorry, CTP, a breakout project for the corridor feasibility study. We don't currently have that and we are not able to submit for chapter 30 um, scoring without that feasibility study. So it is crucial that we get that feasibility, get working on that feasibility study. And also DPW has pointed out that we need to begin to reserve the necessary right of way. Those were both in last year's letter. Again, that's the scope of that work. Um, the third priority is Maryland 26 from 32 east to the Liberty Reservoir. Um, in prior years, the project scope was to widen from four to six lanes. Um, several years ago, SHA completed the Maryland 26 corridor study, which basically found ways to revise the design to a more practical design approach. Rather than complete widening to six lanes, improvements will consist of more limited breakout projects that focus primarily on enhancing the safety of the corridor. And that was brought to you last year, and um, I don't wanna say you signed off on it, but um, basically you directed us to use that in our development review um, comments going forward. So the first break- I'm sorry, to that Mary, really quickly, is that they also provided an access management a proposal to us for 26 as well. So we've been working with State Highway and continuing to improve this corridor and put into practice what's been given in front of us. So the first breakout project, this was in last year's letter, is to convert the eastbound Maryland 26 right turn only lane at Georgetown Boulevard. Again, there's the scope of that proposed project. Fourth priority is Maryland 140 corridor improvements from the county line to Case Mill. Improvements include ultimately a four lane divided roadway, a full interchange at Maryland 91 with, an addition, with additional auxiliary lane east of Maryland 91 and access management improvements. Um, we identified last year an initial breakout project for design funding for this intersection of Maryland 140 at 91. 
following the recent completion of a concept study to evaluate a jug handle type design for westbound traffic. And we are pleased that this project is now funded for full design. Thank goodness. So again, okay. Um, one new request has been made and you should have that in your packets. Also, it was a letter sent from the town of Mont Airy on August 20th requesting your consideration of inclu inclusion of Maryland 27 Ridge Road improvements in this year's priority letter. Um, the request, it's a one page letter, cited the town's 2016 Route 27 quarter study recommendations for a number of improvements, which include boulevard separation of lanes, controlled intersection to allow for pedestrian crossings and other improvements. And they noted that future development of properties in this vicinity are on the cusp of fruition. So this is something we would like direction from the board on whether or not you would like this included in the priority letter going forward. And if so, what um, what type of priority you would like us to give it? And we will have to, if you would like to, we have to refer back to that study to provide you the scope of work that might be included in the project description, but we can bring that to you next time. Um, I, Guess I'll continue with the presentation well, and then I'll, I'll we can just say, back to you. Ms. Lane, thank thank you for including the Mount Airy letter. I think a lot of this is contingent upon what happens with the Harrison Leisure property. But I think it's important we get out in front of this ahead of time. So if we can include this, I'd, I'd really like to have this involved in the studies forthcoming. Okay, I'll just move through the presentation and then you can provide us direction as a group just Thank at the you. end of this presentation. Um, the two streetscape projects, Maryland 851 Sykesville Main Street, Springfield Avenue, and Maryland 31 New Windsor Main Street, you can see in front of you the um, project scope. So the first streetscape is um, in Sykesville and concept has been completed for many years for this project, but it's not currently funded for design. Uh, several years ago, the road was upgraded from local to major collector, so it makes it more competitive for federal money. Um, the update, as you all know from DPW, is that the water sewer project is slated to start early in the summer of 2022, and in conjunction with the stormwater project being completed by SHA, upon completion of stormwater, the water and sewer projects can move forward. So this was really the first step of moving this um, streetscape project, which has been in the letter for years, this was the first step in moving it forward. Mary, does this include the bridge? I do not believe this includes the bridge. Okay. Again, the map showing how the work would be. Um, the second streetscape project, and it's been in for many years, is New Windsor Main Street. This includes improvements to sidewalks, enhancement to bicycle and pedestrian accessibility, as well as roadway improvements. This project would be coordinated with the replacement of water lines within the limits of the streetscape by the town. And again, this has been holding up this project for many years. We did receive an update from the town that an application for MDE funding of the water main project has been submitted and they're now preparing an application for funding through USDA. The Maryland 31 water main project is moving and they have been in contact with SHA, there will be a meeting scheduled in the near future to discuss and coordinate the streetscape project and the water main project. So this project also appears to be moving forward with SHA. Good. Um, regarding transit, we always include transit in this, but it's always completely reflective of what you have in your ATP request for FY23, which was before you several weeks ago, and I believe a public hearing is scheduled in February. But what um, I've been told by DPW is that Carroll County is requesting operating funding for replacement buses and preventative maintenance funding and outside of the ATP also in the early plan planning stages of preparing for alternate fuel vehicles along with the supporting infrastructure including the use of solar panels for power as well as bus coverage. We've had for many years these two trail projects. There is no change um, from Rec and Parks to either of these. The Governor Frank Brown Trail, as you know, has been held up for many years um, based on security concerns with the Readiness Center at the Springfield Hospital property. And um, Westminster Community Trail has been moving forward in recent years. 
However, we did receive an update from DPW. They would like us to note that this project needs to be evaluated due to the large level of risk due to the path being over a sewer force main, two water main lines, and a high pressure gas line. So additional concerns that we always include in the letter beyond those priorities, um, those four major capacity enhancing priorities is the FY22 request included future discussion of Maryland 140, Sullivan Road to Market Street to widen it from six to eight lanes with a full interchange at Maryland 97 and continuous flow intersections at Center Street and Angler Road, and also to include pedestrian facilities. DPW has noted that there should be a partnership with the county to construct necessary roundabouts in the area of these crossings to allow for continuous flow intersection development. So we could add that to the letter. Um, other concerns you noted last year is Maryland 31 and Medford Road safety concerns. Um, a request for a study, of Maryland 26 Johnsville Road study of safety concerns and Maryland 140 Mayberry Road support for finalizing design and construction. This is another good news. The project is now um, funded for construction and I believe notice to proceed is in March. Um, this is an, another additional concern given to us from DPW. Um, I can read it if you want, but it is regarding a turnaround for the Northern landfill. I guess I will read it. Um, the Northern landfill located at 140 in Westminster utilized res by residents and commercial entities. Current turnarounds on Maryland 140 are not adequate for safe movements of multi-axle vehicles in a heavily traveled corridor. Northern landfill is currently in a feasibility study that will include looking into a change to the entrance location, but the crossover traffic will need to be addressed to provide safe crossings of multi-axle vehicles. Safety enhancements should include widening of 140 at the turnarounds immediately east and west of the Northern landfill, development of jug handles or the addition and or the additional of signaling. So that is what they are requesting. We add to the portion of the letter of additional concerns. This is something new this year. Um, the Baltimore Metropolitan Council BMC has a congestion management process committee and we, I am on it. We have been meeting over the past probably nine months to talk about interjurisdictional cooperation with our priority letters. And they have prepared um, this text, the following text for inclusion in the various counties priority letters. It shows the coordinated efforts to identify and support priorities across jurisdictional boundaries and conveys to MDOT the multi-jurisdictional approach to developing priorities. This is obviously optional to all of the counties and you can include some, none, or all of what they have suggested. So the next few slides have the suggested language. Um, the first one is very general. As a member, member of the Baltimore Regional Transportation Board, we are very invested in cost-effective, systematic, and regionally integrated approaches to addressing multimodal congestion, mobility, and safety in the Baltimore region. We have identified several regional priorities. This first priority, this bullet, which I'm not going to read, um, is addressing the regional transit plan for the state. And they've identified um, corridors, obviously none of which are in Carroll because they're transit corridors. But they are requesting that um, that we include this language as a um, show of interjurisdictional cooperation. The second bullet is transportation systems management and operations, it's referred to as TISMO, strategies offer cost-effective and considered approaches that leverage our investments in the existing transportation system. We strongly support funding and implementing TISMO strategies, particularly in MDOT SHA TISMO system corridors, and then they list them, and are particularly interested in how these strategies can address the region's freight bottlenecks. I will say that of the eight corridors listed. Number 11 is in Carroll. It's 140. It goes from basically Westminster through Carroll to um, all the way to the Baltimore Beltway to 695. So that is one of the quarters. The other quarters are throughout the rest of the um, Baltimore region. Um, they also would like us to say we strongly support funding and implementing bike and pedestrian projects, particularly cross-border projects 
to enhance safety and provide expanded multimodal options. And then the final bullet is to facilitate this, we would prioritize the following multi-jurisdictional corridors and projects that fall within our jurisdiction. Again, the only one that falls within our jurisdiction is number 11 on that bullet on this on the top of this page. And if I can add two for the second bullet, that's our Patapsico Regional Greenway project mm -hmm. that we've been working diligently on. We um, have just finished up with our consultant and have reached that 30% design. So this is a project that would go from Sykesville, would be the start, through the Patapsico Valley down to um, the Inner Harbor area. So it's a great regional project, brings tourism dollars um, into Carroll County and Sykesville. And um, the alignment's a, a wonderful alignment through uh, county property, um, city property, and Patapsico Valley State Park. So that would be one that we would um, really want to encourage that we include. It's such a great project for regionalism and for Carroll. Thanks for mentioning it. I'm a big proponent of this. I think it's a wonderful project. So the next steps here, based on today's input, we will prepare the next priority letter. Again, looking as always quite similar to the previous years with just updates and any additions you want to make. Um, we'll present this letter to you for further discussion, probably in several weeks. We'll get your approval of the letter, signatures of the delegation in support, and we transmit it to the Secretary of MDOT by April 1st. So even though, um, they say sometimes order doesn't matter in this letter, but then sometimes it really does. So my suggestion would be consider what the order of the top priorities are that we have in the letter. Um, I know that Public Works feels very strongly about moving Maryland 97 up um, in the rankings because there's so much economic development activity happening within Maryland 97 um, and also some right-of-way acquisition that Public Works is trying to uh, work with now as road improvements and economic development continue along that segment. So again, this is your letter. This is your letter to prioritize what we have on here to include or exclude or to reorganize um, the different projects. So you talk about moving uh, to second priority up to number one. Yeah, that's I think what you're sharing. I think um, yeah. part of that would be- that, That's the request. You know, part, part of that would be um, what has the more likelihood of getting accomplished with the resource that the state's willing to put well, out there? Um, yeah, if we're looking at economic development, I think the, the 97 thing is, is, is yeah. because of the uh, industrial parks that are mm -hmm. around it. And, the, and, the, yeah. and you know, just like Commissioner Wentz pointed out, they, they, we, they changed that, made it a little better, mm -hmm. and now there's more development going on already. Right, right. No, I, I, I agree. I mean. There's very limited space, industrial space, and economic growth, and that is, you know, largely on the 97 corridor. Right. So, but again, if to me, if uh, reprioritizing putting them, putting that above it, would the state provide the resources to do the things that we want them to do? Um, and if we think that's a true statement, then yeah, I'm, I'm for it. Uh, you know, th a lot of work's being done on 32 for all the right reasons, but um, yeah. you know that that is a concern. Is how do we expand 97 to make it more appealing for the growth that we want on the 97 corridor? So. I'm in favor of putting one thing to consider for 97, um, and what we would really push for is to get that study to feasibility study to get it into what we call what was or what is being called the Chapter 30 scoring system. Um, that's how projects that are scored in Chapter 30 get into the final CPP, these bigger, larger capacity enhancing projects. Um, so maybe in this number one, that's what we would request so we can move it along in that next uh, chain. Um, you know, link in the chain, which is to get it into that Chapter 30 scoring system, which then puts it in that regional competitive level for um, funding for, from the CTP. Yeah. I mean, it, to, to me, that makes sense. Um, you know, every time, well, I won't say every time, when I see these priority letters, um, I think about, uh, 
I, I used to, when I, when I was at Diamond Development in Anne Arundel County, we partnered with uh, the EAGB and the Greater Baltimore and the Greater Washington Board of Trade. And where I'm going is that when there were projects and they were crossing jurisdictions, you know, especially like, uh, you know, the bridges in space between Maryland and D.C. Well, Maryland will go as far as Maryland wants to go, and D.C. will go as far as D.C. wants to go, or Virginia. And then you got this big void, yeah. this big gap. And we have opportunities in Carroll County, but then we have these gaps when we, when we tie ourselves to these jurisdictions. Howard County, Baltimore County, you know, Frederick County, and um, Montgomery County down in Mount Airy. How do we work with them and understand their priorities lined up with our priorities so it's seamless? And, um, you know, down in Sykesville, it's 851 is Howard County coming from the south, and then it comes into Carroll County. Right. And so I'm trying to convince Howard County to say, hey, you're the, you're the entrance into the coolest town in the U.S., <laughs> Sykesville, uh, and you know, it would behoove them to strengthen that, that corridor. Um, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, it's, it's also Westminster and Carroll County, you know, and, and we're working on that is how do we get Westminster to put their resources, right. you know, together. So I think what I'd like to see is what are the priority letters of other jurisdictions and how they dovetail to ours, or how do they show the gaps that, you know, uh, exist? Um, so other jurisdictions, you're talking about other counties? Around other counties, us. yeah. Um, Just to see what they have to say. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it could be, I won't say frivolous, but not get the, the value that we think we should be getting if Baltimore County is not doing anything on the other side of the river on 26, or Howard County's, you know, stopping at their border and, and don't want to take on 32 uh, up to 851, you know, which is still their jurisdiction. So I don't know. Um, those are my thoughts. I don't think there's any uh, action here except discussion. Is that correct, Linda or Mary? Yeah. Um, no, just more direction. So what I'm hearing is to move 97 up potentially. Um, and what about the inclusion of Maryland 27, adding that as number five to the letter or somewhere else in that ranking? I would put, I was just going to mention that. Now I've lost my page, but I was going to say maybe perhaps we should put that um, on the urban uh, reconstruction as uh, number three, just before transit projects. That'd be my suggestion. I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> I think it plays into what was said about the 97 corridor with the economic development because we're also facing the same with 27 corridor. You don't like that, Miss Windham? Well, I, I don't know. I'll leave it up to Mary and Linda, but I think it's a bigger. These are like within yeah. towns, the, 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 yeah. The yeah it's not, towns. that's not the right place. I was thinking it, had, it should it be number down. five in the first section. Right. I, uh, I think, Mary. In the first section, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that is correct. I, I would suggest that we add that as one of our right. patch enhancing projects. Because it should be in the first. Well, it's not, it's not real. I mean, I guess maybe part of it goes through the town, but it's not the streetscape. Right, the same I, I, goes you're right. Main yeah, street. It, you're right. It's, you're right. More than 27. It's a big dollar amount potentially, so we're looking at projects that would be like over five million dollars, and this type of project would be much larger than that. So we could look at it as number five in the right first section highway whatever. capacity yeah. enhancing projects. Okay. Yeah, that is, that's true because it is on 27. I was yep. right. Yeah. If we had a map, I wouldn't have made that mistake. <laughs> if you were known, Carol Kennedy, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so would the scope of the project be as was in the their study that they had in 2016? It went from the county line to Lysheer Road or Drive, whichever that is. That was the length of what they were looking at, and it was improvements. I can bring that to you next time and, and be more prepared for 
need to discuss that in detail, but that was the length of the project. Sounds about right. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, I think that's good for the length of the project. Of course, I, I don't know if there's any breakout projects that could be included in there right. to get something on it. There were breakout projects, yes. Right. Okay. Um, so a couple actions. One is adding that to uh, the um, highway capacity enhancement projects is number five, as written. Uh, two, if uh, you would, um, you know, reach out to the other jurisdictions or receive their uh, transportation um, program, their uh, their plans and requests and see how they tie into uh, ours. Um, I would appreciate that. Uh, is there anything else? Yeah, moving. Yes, what about the um, suggested seven. language from BMC's uh, congestion management? Yep. Add that. Did you want to include that yep. in your letter? Yes. Did you include adding or moving 97 up to number one? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. I'm good with that. Should have been number one for the last eight years as far as I'm concerned, but well, I've been talking about that for ever since I got in here. I know. And it just sits. I mean, they did add some things out there, which you, but, but it's, it's getting more and more congested now. Right, because they made and it easier than Right. What well, rural farm said? Oh, let's yeah. Well, now, now that let's the put rural farm is there, now it's number yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, because the chicken actually <laughs> it's, it's, it's all gets us into the place where right. it should be number one. Right. Have you seen the chicken? Is there someone dressed as a chicken? No, huh? no. There's a big chicken sitting out there. Oh, I thought maybe someone's dressed as a well, chicken. Well, that's their thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. What else y'all want to talk about, ladies? Yep, that's all we have for you. That's it. Okay. Um, before you take off, I just want to be sure. Chris, do we have any callers on this? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies. Um, Thank you. Chris, do we have any callers? <laughs> no, we have no callers. Okay. Uh, for open admin, the one thing I, I just want to add is um, it's been uh, seen, and I think it was in the newspaper this morning, uh, Delegate Krebs uh, making her announcement that she is not running yeah. for re-election uh, this go-round, um, wishing her the best. I do know she also has a new grandbaby as of last weekend, so a mazel tov to her and her family. Um, and. Uh, you know, just want to thank her for the work that she continues to do and has done for the last 20 years. But, um, you know, work we do with the delegation and others is very important as we continue to move forward and it dovetails right back into Commissioner Wentz and Frazier's engagement and involvement with MAKO and the importance, as some people will say, it's a crazy town down there, but I would never say that. Um, <laughs> Just crazy. I've okay. never called it crazy. <laughs> I've always called it a quaint little village. Yeah, that's correct. You have. That's what it is. I'm not looking at you. Well, yeah. Okay. Anything for open admin? Do you have minute closed minutes to approve? Of course, I have and, closed minutes to approve. And I have something to mention. Okay. So we Motion have closed minutes on Motion. January 27th. What were they for? Um, Legal. Closely. Legal advice. Motion to approve the minutes on January 27th from close for legal advice. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on it? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, four. And <coughs> before we get into agendas. Just yes. real quickly, um, something that we had traditionally done for many, many, many years was, um, was um, derailed by uh, the pandemic and we're hoping it won't be again this year but we're uh, at the moment scheduling uh, employee appreciation day again on uh, May 11th I'm not sure what day of the week it is I think it's usually a Wednesday 
Uh, maybe it's a Tuesday. I don't know. I, I haven't looked. But Will May 11th, 2022. Hmm? Will there be live music? <laughs> no, we don't generally have live music. But it's at the, it will be at the Ag Center and um, as we've had it in the past with food and other yeah. uh, activities for staff to come and enjoy. And we'll all volunteer to help serve and stuff like that, like the four. Hopefully, hopefully. Good. Yep. Badminton, hopefully. Cornhole. Yep. Hopefully, we can do it all there the way we did it three years ago now. You the champion? Did you win the, the tournament before? Or there was no. no actual tournament, but if you want to say I'm the champion, yes, you're no, right. he, You're the champion. <laughs> he okay. was eliminated in the That's first it. round. <laughs> By you? What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't want to talk about your bird. Anything else? Anything else for uh, open admin? Ms. Wanda, you on? Let's go over agendas. Wanda? Let's see. What's that? Everyone. Wanda's there. Okay, Wanda, are you there? Looks Wanda, like check your hear well. <laughs> <laughs> as long as she can hear. Yeah, I haven't heard that for a day or two. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we will go through agendas with the expectation that you can hear us, and if there are changes, we will add them. So looking at February 7th, we have nothing. February 8th, I will be attending the Ag board meeting at 7 p.m. over the center. On Wednesday, uh, the MACO Tax Subcommittee, uh, Commissioner Wentz and the Legislative Committee, Commissioner Frazier and Wentz will be attending, both being virtual. On Thursday, we will have open session. Starting at 9, we'll have a legislative and update along with a COVID update and coronavirus relief fund, the CRF final report, uh, state and local fiscal recovery fund, FRF updates uh, that will be provided. And that's all we have right now, but the expectation there'll be more. Got nothing on Friday, Saturday, and Commissioner Frazier will be wishing everybody a happy Valentine's Day as he does his podcast on the 13th. On the 14th, we have nothing. Happy Valentine's Day for all. Tuesday, the 15th, Planning Commission. Has been canceled. Has been canceled. Okay. Uh, Veterans Advisory meeting. Commissioner Weaver and I will be attending. Um, we'll see if that's virtual. If it stays virtual, it may be in person. On Wednesday, uh, MACO virtually tax subcommittee with Commissioner Wance and Legislative Committee, weekly meetings with Commissioner Frazier and Wance. That actually might be in person. I was going to say, it's, it's getting close. Maybe. I think. Yeah. Uh, I think they've got the library on West Street, which has a huge room in it, and apparently we're looking at doing in person, so we'll see. And then uh, on Thursday, we have open session. And right now, we just have request for approval for annual plan for fiscal year 2022. And that's from the uh, Bureau of Housing. Um, Ms. Steckel will be presenting. And nothing Friday, Saturday, and Commissioner Boucher has the podcast on the 20th. I expect those open sessions to fill up uh, as time moves on. Am I missing anything for the good of the group? And we are done. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 For a <laughs> adjourned. <laughs>